true evidence-based practice is using scientific data to the best of our knowledge, which is always going to be always going to be behind because that's how the scientific process works. It's going to be a little bit delayed, um, but it's also using anecdotal evidence. And then finally, it's also applying it to the context of the client and mm. their behavior. So that's a true evidence-based process. It doesn't neglect any one of those. It doesn't hyper-focus on one of them either. The, the mistake some people make is they just focus purely on anecdotal or they fo focus purely on trying to make the behavioral change who are understanding some of the science or some of the anecdote and letting it all influence the true evidence-based practice. Yeah. Uh, but that's a big thing like, yeah, science bound versus maybe science based or science influenced and evidence based. They're all slightly different things. <laughs> so what's your problem with squats? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't shit. worry. Don't hey, worry. So it's been a great show guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you for me out. Um, Boom. What's up everybody. Ooh, this is the episode you've all been waiting for. Eugene Teo is on the show. Uh, you might have seen us have debates on social media. Really smart guy. I love the fact that he came on the show to discuss some of the things that we may disagree upon. For example, are squats overrated? Barbell squats in particular. What about posture? Can you correct it with exercise? We actually had some great discussions. Would love your input in the comments. In fact, here's how you can win the program MAPS Aesthetic. That's the program I'm giving away right now. Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Tell us what you think about the discussion. Make it a good comment. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you do all of those things and we like your comment, we pick your comment, we'll notify you in that section and let you know that you won free access to the very popular workout program, MAPS Aesthetic. Also, we got a sale going on right now. The RGB bundle is 50% off. So that's MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, Kettlebell for Aesthetics, the Sexy Athlete Mod, and the Butt Builder Blueprint. All of that in that bundle, 50% off. And we also have an individual workout program that's on sale, MAPS Suspension. This is a suspension trainer-based workout program. That program is also 50% off. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code JULY50, JULY50, no space, for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Eugene, welcome back, dude. Mm. Oh, it's great yeah. to be here. Yeah. You know what I like about you? Is uh, that because we're gonna start with that? We were just oh, let's start with that. I feel like it's shit so I feel like it's shit south. Is coming with that right there. No, let me tell you not. what I like about you first. Before I tell you I don't let's like. start with the one thing. No, that's not it. Uh, no, we were just talking off air about how many people in our space are so like sensitive that it's so hard to discuss things and talk about things. But and we just talked about people who we like who are not like that. Mm. You're one of those people. I, yeah. I really enjoy talking to you because you're very objective. You have good conversations, good discussions. Um, so that's why we like having you on the Thank show. You. So we I'm, I'm glad to glad to hear that. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> so what's your problem with squats? With that. <laughs> you've done a few a few Sorry, posts on yeah. no no you've done a few posts on squats and um, saying things like you don't have to squat or something along those lines. Maybe you can clarify a little mm -hmm. bit on maybe some of the issues. Is it that people mm -hmm. emphasize them too much or that some mm -hmm. people don't need to do them? Like what's the, what's the deal with yeah. that? So specifically, it was not squats. I think everybody should be squatting in general. Oh, okay. like the squatting motion. We definitely need to squat to be able to do that. But my issue is the overemphasis of a barbell squat specifically. Oh. And and even not even just a barbell squat, but a barbell back squat being like the king of exercises. Like if you ask somebody, hey, what's the king of exercise? It's going to be barbell deadlift or it's going to be a barbell squat. Mm. And they say, yeah, you must do those two things. For some reason, barbell bench press gets got a toss to the side. No one cares about bench press, <laughs> which is why I, I care. Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, barbell squat, barbell drop, they're, they're there. And it's got to be conventional. It can't be sumo because mm. sumo is for cheaters, right? Mm. Um, but they're the two king exercises. And I say, well, why is that? And why are we emphasizing that? And not, not just emphasizing, but why do we force feed that to a lot of people? Where we, I definitely think that we all need to squat and we should all be squatting with some kind of resistance, whether it's for some people, just body weight resistance could be enough, whether it's a goblet position, whether it's, whether it is a barbell as well. I think a barbell is still a great tool. But what I see um, in the industry by coaches is they have this belief that we all have to be doing a barbell back squat as a mainstay in our programs all the time. And that that, that is the gold standard that we should be working towards. So maybe like my mum, she can't do a barbell back squat right now, but I should be saying we should be working her towards being able to do that. That should be the goal. And I say, well, well, why is that? Like, why should I put that arbitrary standard on her as the outcome for her to be working towards when she doesn't care about that? Like she doesn't need that in her age or in part of her goals or anything like that. And the same thing applies to most people. And even like someone like, maybe my mum is a very niched audience. What about most of us? Like, do we all need to be doing a barbell squat for our goals of getting stronger, 
building more muscle mass, getting more mobile, getting more flexible and just improving like bone density. Do we really need to be doing a barbell back squat? And unless if you are specifically a barbell athlete, like a powerlifter, and weightlifter or a crossfitter, I believe that we don't. Like those people definitely need to do it and they should do it a lot. But for anything else, which is probably 99% of people who are in the gym, because they're not powerlifters, they're not Olympic lifters, they're not CrossFit athletes, they need to be doing a squat motion. So do they need to be doing it with a barbell? Probably not. If they want to, yeah, knock yourself out, go for it. You know, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to give you yeah. like knee cancer. I, do you have a theory on why that is? Like, why do you think that has become so popular? What, do you have a theory around yeah, I, that? I agree with you, by the yeah. way. I think I agree 100% with mm. what you just said. I, mm. I totally agree training lots of people, um, lots of different people. Mm. Uh, just squatting, the motion of squatting is very important. <laughs> it's fundamental. Yes. Uh, yeah. But I, what you're saying uh, 100% makes perfect sense. So, mm. yeah. So, so what Adam said, um, what do you yeah. think? Look, I think it's a big thing where people have a hard time separating their emotions from logical reasoning. And this is beyond sport. This is with everything. And if you think about like what do what were most of us brought up on? It was things like pumping iron. It was yeah. it was all the, we had the strong emotional attachments of those <clears throat> Arnold Schwarzenegger, those kind of bodybuilders, powerlifters. And we see very successful athletes who are very strong or very big or very athletic for performance. And we see them doing a barbell squat. And we just take that in face value and say, ah, the barbell squat is what we must do. Like you look at a guy like Tom Platts, like he's got ridiculous legs. He still does to this day. And he's still barbell squatting. He's the king of barbell squats and he's the king of legs. And we see that and say, okay, logically, well, we think logically, but it's actually more emotionally. Oh, that's the answer. That's what you must do because all these other people have, have done that. And if you if you also look at how most of us were brought up in terms of our own personal training, like when did you guys start training? Like ourselves or yeah. training clients? Oh, yourselves, like oh, yourself. Yeah. I was 14. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably teenage probably 13, years. 25? Yeah. 25 years ago. Oh, 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a, you're a late, <laughs> late bloomer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how old were you? I was 13. Yeah, yeah. Like, so I was like 13, Junior 14. Yeah. yeah, similar kind of thing. So, And what would most of us do when we start eventually training legs, which might've been like five years later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we'd probably start doing barbell squats and our legs would respond. And why do the legs respond? Was it because of the barbell squat or was it because you started giving them some kind of lower body stimulus? It's probably more just the stimulus, not the actual squat itself. But in that age, we have a hard time separating the two. And we just say, oh, barbell squat, I grew legs. I got stronger, I got more athletic, I built strength, I built muscle mass. That's the answer. And it creates this confirmation bias where we see in ourselves, oh, I got all these awesome results doing a barbell squat and that must be the answer. And then we just look at Arnold Schwarzenegger. We look at mm -hmm. Tom Platts. We look at a lot of Olympic athletes across a variety. So we see them all doing barbell squats. Oh, that must be the thing that confirms my bias that the squats are what built my legs. And we never challenge that thought process. And then when somebody comes along who does challenge it, we're like, no, no, you must be completely wrong because I've got all this anecdotal history of me growing big legs when I was in my newbie phase, honestly, of growing, of growing legs. So you must be incorrect. And we never really open ourselves up to challenging the idea of saying, well, what is it actually that caused us to get stronger, to get bigger, to build muscle mass? Was it really that barbell squat with a back squat position? Or maybe I could have gotten similar results with the front squat. Maybe I could have gotten similar results with other exercises, all like the split squats, lunges, maybe even just I wouldn't recommend this per se, but even if you were just doing just machines, maybe you could have gotten a similar response. Um, but for whatever reason, we just emotionally attach it to that because that's the one thing. So I that's think, that's an interesting theory. This actually highlights our age gap right here. This is funny yeah. because we're we're all. I'm 40. This guy's 42, 41. Like you're 30. So my experience in and my theory on the whole squat narrative now is it's it's coming back into favor where it had fallen out of favor yeah. for like over mm -hmm. a decade. Mm -hmm. When I was 20, nobody squatted. In fact, we used to joke around at the gym that we had yeah. one squat rack and it had dust Cobwebs. on it because yeah, right. nobody squatted. These are so 35, 40,000 square foot gyms that we yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. So they did not 2,000 workouts a day and not one person squatting. This was right. before CrossFit. So I think the introduction of CrossFit and that coming in really started to repopularize the barbell lifts because, and still to this day, you rarely will see, you will now more than ever, but I, 10 years ago, you would never see someone deadlift in a 24 hour fitness. Oh just no, didn't, no, just I, didn't I deadlifted exist. and I would have members come up to me and I'm a manager, I'm managing the yeah. gym. They'd come up to me and freak out. You're going to hurt your back. What are you doing? This isn't how you work <laughs> out. 
and I was doing a, a traditional um, deadlift. There's two parts of this conversation mm. that I think we need to separate. Um, one is general advice, mm. and then two is the individualized aspect. Because there's there's mm. so many variances with the individual when you when you're talking about training. I've had cases where split stance exercises were far superior for mm. clients. Others where bilateral exercises uh, were amazing. Generally speaking, the back squat, in my opinion, one of the reasons why it's so great, and I, I agree with a lot of what you said, I don't think it's ideal for everybody. Mm. But generally speaking, I like it because it's uh, it, the leverage is great. It, you can load it very well. And it's hard to do a freestanding squat. Like you mentioned the front squat. Mm. Um, although with the front squat, posture tends to be a little better. Mechanics in some cases are better, but in other cases they're not. Like holding a barbell across the shoulders, especially yeah. weightlifting style, it's very, very challenging for a lot of people. Whereas, and not saying a back squat isn't challenging, but it's a little easier to get in that position. For sure. And then the load you can handle um, and the leverage seems to work really well. So that's why I think it's a, it's a great, like, like try and do a goblet squat or, although now they have belt squats, which I think are pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have those forever. And most gyms still don't have that. So I think it's important we separate, like here's the general advice, but there's always individual variances. And I think that's what you're talking about, right? In, mm, in many mm. cases, in many individual cases, these exercises that everybody touts as being so amazing might not work. They might not work for you. You well, know? I think that's where we're yeah. all on the same page in this conversation is, although I'm super pro barbell back squat, I would also tell you that 90% of my clients never got to a barbell back squat. <laughs> so yeah. that's where I we're all yeah. on the same page. I had to do a goblet, sure. squ goblet squats, Bulgarian split squats, walking lunges tend to be or step ups, tend to be the movements that I'd have to regress all my clients to in hopes that one day I could get them to a place where they could do a, a good barbell back squat. But I think what we're, I think what's interesting is listening to you talk about the kind of history. Yeah, of the how everybody says it's amazing. Yeah. Nobody said it <laughs> yeah. was amazing. Yeah. My experience was the opposite. Well, we were I was sell kid, them on the idea. Of yeah. It. I was Always. a kid yeah, was who was tough leg pressing and leg extension and lunges and doing all that. And just, I didn't barbell back squat cause I didn't know how I really didn't. Even as a young trainer, right. um, I was intimidated by it. I didn't ever had anybody who took me under their wing and taught me how to do it properly. I didn't want to look like a fool in it. And it was hard. You know, the few yeah. times I did attempt it, it was yeah. very, very hard. It didn't feel right. And so I avoided it for most years and got away with it because the gym was like, no, nobody was squatting or deadly, but now it's different. I it mean, was CrossFit. Mm. CrossFit made squat, made uh, barbell exercises, uh, come into the, to the fray for sure. into the yeah, mainstream. I Literally. Yeah. I mean, what he said is hundred percent true. I would manage these massive gyms, <laughs> so much equipment, one squat rack mm. and nobody used it ever except for do curls. Sometimes you see somebody doing that joke, right? Curls in the squat yeah, rack. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a, a commonality in the early late nineties, early two thousands when I would manage you know, these gyms. Now you mention it when I was like 2009 or so when I was first personal training and working in like a commercial gym, yeah, we big, big boss commercial gym, one squat rack. Yeah. And that's my bias because I grew up as a bodybuilder. Like yeah. I looked up to bodybuilders. I was, when I was, in that time, I was a bodybuilder myself. So I was looking at, yeah, all my tunnel vision on squat rack, yeah. my tunnel vision on Arnold Schwarzenegger. But from the industry perspective, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's, it's, yeah. it's interesting that yeah. you look back to the 70s and even early 80s because late 80s and 90s, mm. squats were out of favor with bodybuilders. It was all leg press. Yeah, and hack it squat. was. It was like yeah. Dory, Dorian Yates is all machines. Yeah. Yes. All like, yeah. Nobody yeah. did. Nobody did squats. Mm. What, mm. what do you think about, and I've heard one of the most compelling arguments that I've heard with lower body exercises, and again, we're speaking generally here because yeah. when, you, when you look at the individual, anything can change, okay? Yeah. It can all change, right? But when we're talking generally- I've heard the argument that split stance exercises mm -hmm. are superior to bilateral uh, lower body exercises like squats. So like mm. lunges, yeah. Bulgarian split stance squats, the, and all the variations are better because it more simulates locomotion, running. You always have one leg in front, one leg in back type of deal. Mm. What do you think about that, that type of argument? Um, ooh. I would tend to agree and lean more towards that. Like- um, yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with that because, um, from a pure efficiency perspective, you are going to get a lot more, um, more of a tension on that muscle on both the front leg and the rear leg, depending how you set things up. Well, I think that's one thing people really um, don't realize a lot is like say on a split squat or a Bulgarian split squat, especially that rear leg is working a ton, mm -hmm. and it's not just working; it's working in a range of motion um, in that fully stretched position for the quad anyway, that you don't really get on many other exercises mm -hmm. for the lower body. And if all you ever did 
for the rest of your training career was just a bilateral squat where you didn't get that fully stretched length and position on that rear leg, who knows? But I, would, I wouldn't I would be surprised if there were some deficits then in mobility because of that. Yeah. Um, I'm also thinking of the counter yeah, torsion the, and, yeah. the, and the stability, right? Yeah. And that's where we've got to, you know, weigh these things up is we get the extra benefits of a, of a um, stability challenge. We get the extra, we get the extra benefits of maybe this, maybe replicating locomotion. Um, and those things will obviously compromise the overall weight. Hmm. That compromises the overall stability. So the actual benefit is it is also part of a drawback. So again, it comes down to weighing things down. But I'll say for sure in terms of how I program for myself and for most people on a very general perspective, I would rather they would do a split squat variation or a single leg unilateral um, variation as opposed to a bilateral if I just had one exercise to if give If you had them. to pick. If I had to pick. I would yeah. say it's more superior. It's um, a lot more accessible as well mm -hmm. for a lot of people. And yeah, they're going to use less weight, but regardless of the goal, apart from pure power lifting, um, when is, why is, or when is weight ever the real thing we should be striving towards? Like lifting sheer heavy, heavy weights. As long as you're exposing your joints, your muscles to the required resistance to a significant amount of tension, the weight on the bar is less and less relevant because yes, you might lift less weight, but you're still exposing your muscle potentially to the similar amounts of forces. Yeah, and I think uh, in the beginning of training, measuring your strength and getting stronger is much more important than it is later on. What I mean yes. by that is like now my training, like you know, at some point you hit a ceiling, you're not going to, otherwise I'd be squatting 5,000 pounds. I've been working out for so long. Right? right. So at this point I'm not looking at the weight, but when I first start training someone, if I get them to add three reps, five reps, 10 pounds, mm. they go from a hundred pound to 150 pound squat, uh, a huge benefits, mm. you know, when mm. you're starting to, after a while, it's more important to look at other things. So I, I agree with you. I think it's uh, pretty nuanced. What do you think about the the functional versus just hypertrophy argument yeah. that we see so much in, yeah. in on social media? Like, is that I've heard people say just getting bigger and stronger makes you more functional. Then I've heard other people say, and I I, I agree with both to some extent. Then I've heard other people say, well, no, uh, the specificity of a functional exercise what makes you more functional in the real world type of deal. Like, what do you think about that yeah. conversation? I, I definitely lean more towards the lens of saying, whatever helps you build muscle mass, build strength, build coordination, build all these different aspects that we need to be focusing on. Whatever helps you do that as efficiently as possible is going to make you more functional. It's not about necessarily recreating everyday life motions or in some way preparing you for what you're doing in your sport because the thing that's going to help, help prepare you the most for your sport is being more muscular, stronger, more mobile, more agile. And it won't necessarily come from one specific movement. It's all, or even one specific class of movements. It's going to come from the way that you set up your entire broad context of your training program and making sure you're hitting all these qualities and not having deficits anywhere. Like even like we can say like the maybe, I don't even know, maybe, maybe we could potentially say the split squat is more functional than a, a back squat in inverted commas there because of the extra stability demand, sure. which makes it more um, applicable to athletic populations. But again, that's looking at things through a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And are we ever really going to give our athletic client or our gen pop client <clears throat> just one exercise? Mm -hmm. For discussions, we'll talk about that. And it's cool to have those discussions. But realistically, in the real world, we're never going to give them just a back squat or just a, a split squat or just some rotational med ball throw kind of thing in a lunge stance. We're going to give them a whole host of things. And what makes things functional or not is not the one exercise, but the application in a broader sense of a program. And that's where people are missing um, the forest for the trees. They're focusing on having these arguments about saying, hey, squats aren't functional. Split squats are better. Doing it with a with a barbell held overhead in that position is going to be even more functional. Yeah. Doing a balance kind of boast ball is even more functional. It's like, well, uh, who the fuck cares about that? Like, you're yeah. not going to give them just one exercise. Yeah. But it looks cool for Instagram. Yeah. It looks cool for Instagram to have those discussions, to be like, yeah, this yeah. is the most functional movement ever. You know, there's well, a it highlights too what we talk about all the time so much is that in it's the part that I can't stand about our space is we tend to get in these camps. Yeah. You know, like I'm the crossfitter, I'm the bodybuilder, I'm the power lifter. It's like, fuck, why wouldn't you use all the techniques from all of those? Yeah, didn't mixed martial arts teach us a lesson? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, you got to know all this stuff. You know, I, I heard, uh, so Justin was on a podcast recently um, on Joe DeC, uh No, what's his name? Joe Franco's podcast. podcast. I saw that, yes. Yeah, yes. Very, good, very good discussion. And one thing that I think was an excellent point was how they brought up the skill required to do a particular lift that may, the, the, the curve or the learning curve may be so long that it may not be worth doing that particular exercise mm. for an athlete because they're about to go into season. For example, yeah. you take a young athlete and you're like, okay, you know, power cleans are great for power, mm. you know, but we got three months 
to train, yeah. you know, to get into season. And I'm not even, I'm going to barely get you to do just the barbell with the power clean because it's so technical. So instead we're going to do kettlebell mm -hmm. swing or we're going to do mm -hmm. a trap bar deadlift, maybe jump or something like that. Right. So that's another part of this conversation that changes everything. So for example, I'll give you an example. I've seen studies where they measure muscle activation and they'll compare two exercises that are similar, but one far, there's far more skill involved. So like yes. give you an example, uh, a pull down to the front versus a pull down behind the neck. Okay. Yep. Both very similar. Okay. But they'll show in these studies and they'll take, you know, 20 college aged males with some ex, uh, you know, exercise experience, what they say, which means that they maybe played sports and they'll say, Oh, the pull down to the front activates the lats more than the pull down to the back. And I say, maybe because I know a behind the neck pull down is requires so much more skill mm. that you'd have to practice it for a while to really connect and be able to activate the lats, mm. you know, with that particular exercise. Whereas if you pull sure. down the front, you're going to turn it on much easier. So that's another part of this whole conversation that I think is, really interesting and we don't really consider that when we have these kind of discussions and debates. Yeah, I think I mean in terms of being a coach, that's a, a big part of the whole thing, especially with athletes. You have to structure like where what do I do that's going to be the most effective in that time uh, sequence where it's going to adequately prepare them uh, in, in the best way possible where I'm like assessing risk reward each one of these exercises that we're going to program. How long does it take for me to implement this skill? Uh, you know, it, how, how much is that skill going to apply to the field? And like, you're kind of like really like going through the, the whole host of like what, what it, what it is, what's the best plan and what for this group of kids specifically too. So not just like mm. in general, which I think that a lot of coaches, we get into the general side of things uh, way too often where we're not really, you know, looking at needs. Like there were so many needs specifically where, you know, hip flexors and we need strengthening there. And like, we yeah. need, we need to mobilize certain joints because people are dropping like flies. And uh, so I think like there's so many nuances to a lot of these conversations that like, you know, plug and play that person specifically in into uh, like a hypertrophy setting and what their goals are like and determined to just like make maximize that opportunity may look completely different than, you know, your athlete's experience, your mom's experience. Like, yeah. you know, so I, I think that we need to talk about these things a lot more because like people aren't, need to understand there's so many different formulas and paths people can go uh, with training. Absolutely. And there's like, not, even beyond that, there's also a whole lot of, um, I mean, there's a whole bunch, a whole bunch of confusion. And a lot of it comes from um, people really don't have the skill set or the knowledge, which is completely fine to interpret what these things really mean. Like yeah. taking something like, even like um, a lot of studies on activation, they're using EMG yeah. as, a, as a test. And like, well, how good is EMG for really measuring what's happening within the muscle? It's going to tell you some electrical activity and activation, mm -hmm. but does that translate to an exercise being, say, better than another one for activating your lats or glutes? Yeah. There's a lot of flaws there um, in terms of what actually means for muscle building or for strength building or actual tension being placed on the muscle and how the muscle has to then produce force where the electroactivity doesn't necessarily translate to all of those things. No, you, I'll you give you an that. example, yeah. Eugene. Uh, wearing a weight belt activates your core mm. as much or more than not wearing a weight belt. So somebody may see on a study like that. So yeah. someone may look at that and be like, oh, pfft. A weight belt. I mean, they said it was going to weaken my core, but no, it's going to make it stronger. But what you don't realize is wearing a belt your core activates differently. You push out against the belt to create stability. Mm. Whereas when you don't wear a belt, it kind of braces. Mm. So you actually teach yourself a different way to stabilize your core if you always wear a belt versus yeah. if you don't. Those studies, those EMG studies would not tell you that. It would just they say, can't. oh, look, you activate your core wearing a belt, so it's totally fine. I wear it all yeah. the time. And that's the tricky part because then most people, um, like you or I might have these this knowledge of how to interpret that, but most people out there, they don't. They don't understand what these differences are because it does take, you know, a fair amount of experience, a fair amount of background knowledge and maybe biomechanics or anatomy to understand, oh, what is actually going on and why does the EMG result show this or the other? And those are people really, one thing they don't have the knowledge, but they also just suck at asking as to why is the result showing as it is. Yeah. Um, which is a shame because that's where all the arguments come from. That's where all the <laughs> debates. And it's like, well, we're debating, we're probably, probably on the exact same page. Yeah, yeah. We just have different levels of understanding or interpretations of it. And mm -hmm. it's- yeah. Well, so my question to you is because, you know, you are on social media, you communicate to a pretty large audience. Mm. This is something that we early on decided that we were going to focus on because mm. it's really easy to get caught up in the weeds and in the nuances. When I'm talking to someone like you, great mm. discussions, we can do that. But when we communicate, we're communicating to a general audience. Yeah. So we're very, we, we, we talk, we talk about this all the time. We're very careful what we communicate because we know we're talking to, you know, millions of people and we don't want to send the wrong message. For mm -hmm. example, the squat 
isn't great for everybody conversation. Now we just had a great discussion about it, but mm. we're very careful to not communicate that in a way to where the kid listening now has an excuse to not practice barbell squats. Right. Oh, well, those are hard. I'm just going to do leg presses all the time then because yeah. that's a great exercise. How do you, is this something that you have to think about as well? Cause otherwise we're yeah. kind of in an echo chamber. Like I'm just yeah. talking to other trainers and coaches sure. and I'm not reaching the average person. And I don't want to confuse the average person yeah. by focusing too much on this yeah. kind of stuff. It's, it's, incredibly challenging that's one thing i respect about you guys a lot is you guys are always you know you you're towing that line you're doing your best to spread good information and you also respect that you can't always go into the nuances on social media this is why you have your podcast where you can really discuss things yeah. in a lot more detail because yeah it's it's a nightmare it's a it's a <laughs> daily struggle every post i'll make is like hmm <laughs> was that I remember the first post that I did that that triggered you guys it was about there's about the barbells a few years ago yeah, yeah, yeah. and you had a discussion about it and i thought you know what what you guys said is absolutely correct. You know, it was refuting a lot of what I said in terms of like you were saying, look, you've done this post and it's correct, but it's also it's going to create that um, that excuse for people yeah. to not push hard on a barbell exercise. I said, you know what? That's right. And and I haven't and I I should have specified that as an extra disclaimer or an extra nuance. It's like, hey, this is not an excuse to to not train hard and just do leg press instead or just do machines instead of squats. Um, but I didn't do that. But then I changed it after I said, you know what? I'll take that on board. That was my bad where I was too hot headed and just jumped into this one nuance without talking about the general um, impact it'll have on the wider audience. And that's why I still do talk about the, um, I guess, downsides in inverted commas to barbell squats mm -hmm. over other movements. But I am always a lot more careful now to say, hey, as much as I think this is some of the features of a barbell squat that may be advantageous and disadvantageous, it's not an excuse for you not to push hard yeah. or it's not uh, a cop out for you to just do a leg press well, you, all day. You have a large audience of very, also very technical experienced trainers mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. you know, we have those as mm -hmm. well, but when we talk to them, we're really talking it's much to them. more general audience. Yeah. Though. And we're yeah. talking to them more about how to communicate to their clients. Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to get into the super intricate details of this, the physiology and science of, mm. you know, whatever. Uh, not because I don't think it's cool. I love it. If I talk to someone like you, I'll, I'll talk to you for hours about shit like that. But just because that's what we've decided. Because otherwise you're screwed. Yeah. It's like if I communicate <laughs> to those people, there's going to be a whole bunch of people over <laughs> yeah. here that are going to yeah. read, read into it wrong and be like, oh, like, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, all right, here's a silly example. Studies show that a cold, cold therapy post-workout will blunt the muscle building signal a little bit. Yep. So now you're going to get a bunch of kids who are like, no cold therapy because I want to maximize muscle growth. So, well, if you're teetering on the on the a line of overtraining, it can actually probably help because you recover mm. a little faster, less inflammation, maybe blunts the signal, but maybe that's what you need because you're constantly overtraining yourself and so it'll actually help you train harder and whatever. So so this kind of stuff is like, it's constant. We got to go back yeah. and forth and kind of, but you have a, a, a large audience. I noticed with your post, really smart technical coaches. Mm. So it's like, I, I can I can feel how you have a tough time. Like, okay, I got to talk it's, to them, but then. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's tricky because over the last probably two or three years, so since I was, I was last here actually, is um, there's been a big shift where probably maybe 80% a few years ago was very smart technical coaches and they're still around. I hope most of them, I don't know. Yeah. Probably, all, probably all blocks me by now, who knows? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but there's there. been, my, my social media across all the platforms has grown a lot more. Mm. And now I've got a lot more of a general audience as well. And now I'm, I'm learning how to navigate those people. And it's still, it's a, it's a continual learning process. Hang on, I've got to now speak to these people as well and make sure that they can understand it and they, they're not getting the wrong message as well. Um, from a lot of my posts, which in the past were a lot more technical. And now I'm saying, hey, how do I make sure that these, this audience doesn't feel alienated or confused, which is a big part, which is a big fear of mine from um, from what I post. Because yeah, you're right. It's yeah. it's it's and that's a, hard to do on hard. social media. I think you, you I think you do a good job. I mean, I do so too. we I mean we talk about you a lot on the show. I think we've plugged you at least uh, five to six times yes. on here where we've talked about <laughs> your post. Well, what it does is it creates great conversation because sure. I I do think that you attack really difficult nuanced. Uh, you know, thoughts that mm. trainers and coaches have. And it's, you, I love the way you put it because every time you put it, I go like, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to say he's wrong with what he's saying, but is this, this is how really I would say it. This is where I'm, I'm, I have a different opinion on it, but yeah. I appreciate that about you. Mm. Like, I, I, you, mm. I think you do a really good job. Uh, yeah, I'd say you're Thank one you. of the better people uh, for sure. Uh, Thank you. In the, in, and in you the don't face. get offended if I no, I hate challenge that. Yeah, because well, I want like, you to. I want that. Like, like you guys say, you know, you don't want an echo chamber. You don't want people just 
always saying, yes, you're so good. Preach. Yeah, prayer hands. Keep going. Yeah, yeah say it loud to people in the back. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like, that's great. Always going to love that. Always going to respect that. But yeah. it's important to be able to have um, discourse where if someone has a different opinion, saying, hey, you know what? Maybe you should have said it this way instead. Or maybe you could have yeah. worded this a bit differently. Yeah. Or, you know what? You're completely fucking wrong. <laughs> you know, in, so, well, sometimes I liked, and I, this happens on our show a lot. Uh, like, people think that um, Sal and I don't like each other, or that, like, people get mad at me. Oh, we should just shut up and let Sal talk. Oh, my God. And a lot of times <laughs> I will challenge something of his that I actually totally agree, but I actually, because I respect his ability to articulate his point, mm. which I think you do a really good job mm. also. So sometimes people misunderstand me. I'll challenge a post or I'll challenge something he says, not necessarily because I disagree, because I think which, where you're you're going is so good and i want to i challenge you so you want to represent somebody else yeah, so yeah. people can there, like yeah. enjoy mm. that conversation mm. and learn that way because i know there's somebody who's thinking yeah. what i'm about to go yeah, what say about this? so what it's about not that? always i'm like it's not like i'm always attacking him yeah. or it, yeah. I, sometimes it's i just that thread yeah i just want to yeah. keep you going yeah. in that direction because i know that you have a lot mm. to say about that point and that dialogue i think people will learn the nuances of both sides and then from there hopefully they can take that information and go oh this is how it applies yeah. to me here's you know here's so. something I've, I've wanted to ask you because you're definitely a science uh based individual in terms of your your um, opinions and kind of what you talk about and write mm -hmm. about and the challenge sometimes with that is our space uh is the science hasn't yet caught up to many people's experiences. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not somebody that's going to say anecdote outweighs, uh, you know, evidence in right. science. However, and I'll use another example. In some cases, I'll take anecdote. And what I mean by that is, because before everybody freaks out, uh, I'll give you a great example. So if you look at like um, wellness and you look at like herbal treatments for inflammation or headaches mm -hmm. or PMS or nausea or whatever, you have ancient old, thousands of years old uh, practices where it's like Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, who they didn't use a scientific method, but they used, let's say, ashwagandha for stress relief for mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years. And up until recently, we now have studies showing ashwagandha to be quite effective for stress mm -hmm. relief over the last maybe 10, 15 years. But before that, it was zero studies. But Ayurvedic medicine, this medicine said, this is amazing. And it was literally wow. hundreds of years of anecdote. Um, and in those cases, I'd say, you know what? I like the anecdote because when you're looking at five, 600 years of people using it, they tease out a lot of stuff and there's some truth there sure. type of deal. And we, we see that with exercise too. And I'll mm. give you an example with fitness. We were told forever that lightweight and high reps doesn't really build lots of muscle. Mm. Lots of bodybuilders are like, no, it builds lots of muscle. You can do 20, 30 reps and you'll build muscle. And then the mm. other people say, no, it doesn't. Well, now we have studies showing, well, if you train with high enough intensity, the high reps will also build muscle. So now the science finally matches the anecdote. Mm. Do you have any any examples or, or how do you navigate this where yeah. you know through experience, you know through training lots of people, mm. this is probably what the deal is, but I have no nothing supporting it. Or maybe even there's some science that counters it, but that mm. is completely different from my experience. It's a tricky one. It's a very, very tricky one. And um, I think first of all, the most important thing that we need to do on any topic, whether it's like the Ayurvedic stuff, the supplemental stuff, the nutrition stuff, whether it's like fasting or ketogenic diets um, or veganism or whatever, like I shouldn't say vegan, more like plant-based diets, because mm -hmm. that's different to a vegan diet. Um, there's going to be a lot of anecdotes that are going to, from thousands of years of experience, where you say, yeah, probably this is better or this is very beneficial. But until it's been rigorously tested, this is why we have the scientific method. We can say that they've probably they might have some benefit, but the danger is c comes from when we make bold, sweeping, definitive statements about mm. it, saying, "Ah, say say ashwagandha." Let's say like a, there is an, a growing amount of research supporting its efficacy and its benefits for inflammation, for thyroid health, for um, for sleep and recovery. And that's but let's say that wasn't around just yet. Say mm. we we're just going off all the Ayurvedic and the ancient Chinese medicine. We could still say, "Yeah, it's probably it, it's got a good chance to be helpful because it has thousands of years backing it up." And that's part of being an evidence based practitioner as well is mm. being able to use anecdotal evidence and use it in your decision making and how it applies to the client. The only thing that I would mention there is just saying like, just be mindful of making any sweeping statements that aren't completely holistically evidence-based where it has been rigorously tested. Because that then creates this false sense of um, of what you must do or what you are lacking. 
and it becomes almost, it can be used very maliciously um, in a marketing way or in a salesy way saying, hey, this is the, um, the ashwagandha that you need to take to fix your sleep or this is the exercise you have to do to be able to, to fix your posture or whatever it is. Yeah. I know that's one that I've, that I, I, oh, I'm we'll very, yeah. 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 Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. So it's been a great show, guys. Yeah. Thank you for me out. Um, no, and, uh, an example of what you're saying, <laughs> what, what first com comes to mind is maybe marketing yourself as a liver guy and biting into all these raw absolutely. organs, trying to claim absolutely. that that is going to you help that specific organ in your body. Right. But the I'm not going to disagree with yet. Yeah. I, I, I agree <laughs> with what you're saying, but I'm going to say this. They do the same thing with scientific studies because oh, there are yeah. studies like I, I, I could pull up 10 articles right now that say compound in chocolate shown to you know burn body fat or some stupid shit. And what they'll do in the study is they'll take one part of it that, and they'll extrapolate, oh, this burns body yeah. fat or fasting um, better for fat loss because it increased fat oxidation, which at the end of the day doesn't make a difference because it's the total calories type of deal. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, here's, again, some of the issues I have with people who are not science basis, but science bound. I'll, I'll give mm -hmm. you some great examples. Mm -hmm. So I've been, uh, you know, I had the luxury of uh, at one point I had a wellness studio. I was a trainer, bro, total like, you know, lift weights, macros, calories. But I had the, the pleasure of working with people who worked in wellness and they were way ahead of what was popular. Mm. And I remember when they would talk about leaky gut syndrome. Okay. Right. Leaky gut syndrome. And the medical community and the scientific community laughed at them. Leaky gut syndrome. This is so dumb. This is bullshit. What are you talking about? And they would, and they were all about it. Well, guess what? Now they call it uh, intestinal hyperpermeability, right? Mm -hmm. This is the this is the medical term now because they've now identified a bit of a rebrand, <laughs> right? Here's another one: um, adrenal fatigue. Okay, lots of people making fun of adrenal fatigue, laughing at it. Now, what the wellness people had right were the symptoms. Mm -hmm. What they had wrong was explaining why your adrenals get fatigued. That's not really what's happening. You have an imbalance between your your HPA axis, right? Mm -hmm. That's actually what's happening. But the symptoms, right, were real. And the, the treatments that the wellness people were actually legit. That's now what they'll recommend for HPA axis dysfunction. So I think it happens on both sides. And both sides can use, like you can use one scientific article done on 15 people, you know, college age males, all athletically, whatever, you know, experience. They'll extrapolate that. Here's your headline. Boom. Take this supplement. It's amazing. Resveratrol lengthens your mm -hmm. telomeres will make you live longer, whatever. But then you also have the people on the other end who say ancient wisdom says, you know, if you eat this herb and, you know, shine your butthole to the sun or whatever the latest thing is, it's going to improve your health or whatever. So I think it happens on both sides. This is what makes yeah. our space so frustrating. It is so frustrating. And that's where um, eventually, so I like people like um, Dr. Andy Galpin. Yeah. Have yeah. you had him on the show before? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. he's great. He's great. Because um, he, he really goes into breaking down... Um, <laughs> mechanistically what's happening within the body how does the physiology of the human body work like what's um what, what are the fundamental biochemical processes here is how it works and then you can then filter in and say okay because this is how the human body works here is how this compound or this stimulus of training or whatever here's how it may interact or here's how it makes complete nonsense mm. like if somebody told me that oh hey carnitine is a great fat burning supplement so here's the latest fat burning supplement is going to help me I'll get caught up in that if I don't understand the deeper layer of the biochemistry and science of how fat loss really occurs. And he's a great guy at explaining that. And yeah. I think that's where, um, this is where a lot of the confusion comes from, from people is they don't understand that deeper layer of just, yeah, how does stuff work? And then why do the things that we take potentially work yeah. or not work? Or, or, or why, so like my favorite is like, there's certain bro science things that the way that they explained it was wrong. But mm. the results actually worked, and it was because of a behavioral adaptation that nobody right. really explained. Yeah. Like, uh, like fasted cardio, fasted cardio. Wake up first thing in the morning, do your cardio. You'll burn more body fat. Right? We know that's baloney. Mm. However, when I would have people do fasted cardio, I understood that it just got them to move more. They'd wake up first thing in the morning yeah. and do yeah. Yeah. a little extra activity, um, and it worked. The other one is, uh, you know, uh, drinking, you know, a gallon or more water a day. Right? Yeah. Uh, we know studies will show that. Except for people who sweat a ton and, you know, endurance athletes doesn't really make that big of a difference, half a mm -hmm. gallon, gallon, whatever. But I knew that when I told my clients to drink a gallon of water every day, they drank less soda mm -hmm. and wine mm -hmm. and juice and they really had no time to drink anything else. <laughs> and, they, and so and they, they would lose they weight. They peed 10 less more calories. calories. <laughs> See, yeah. And, and pe pe people would off. hear that and be like, 
oh, that's not science-based. That's not evidence-based, what you're doing. Yeah. But it actually is. Mm. Like, true evidence-based practice isn't just saying, hey, the research shows you've got to have one gallon of water per 24 hours yeah. to increase your telomeres or whatever, yeah. like make your dick longer. <laughs> um, but true evidence-based practice is using scientific data to the best of our knowledge, which is always going to be always going to be behind because that's how the scientific process works. It's going to be a little bit delayed. Um, but it's also using anecdotal evidence. And then finally, it's also applying it to the context of the client and mm. their behavior. So that's a true evidence-based process. It doesn't neglect any one of those. It doesn't hyper-focus on one of them either. The, the mistake some people make is they just focus purely on anecdotal or they fo focus purely on trying to make the behavioral change who are understanding some of the science or some of the anecdote and letting it all influence the true evidence-based practice. Yeah. Uh, but that's a big thing like, yeah, science bound versus maybe science based or science influenced and evidence based. They're all slightly different things. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. I, I, um, I, I just learned later on that uh, training, and again, I, this is general population. So mm. when I'm working with a bodybuilder or an athlete or somebody that's super neurotic and going to do everything I tell them, totally different. When I'm working with the average person, it was all behavior based, like yep. like the, the mechanistic actions of diet and exercise. If I focused on that with them, or at least focused on teaching them, that was a waste of time. Yeah, uh, like I would know that, but what I did is I always worked on behaviors, always mm -hmm. because that's we're all behavior based creatures for sure. And you tell the client, you know, count this, do that, add up this, and they'll do it for three months and then they're off. But if I say something like hey, eat as much as you want, uh, just don't eat heavily processed foods. And they're like, oh, cool, I get to eat as much as I want. And then they eat 600 calories less a day because that's what happens yeah. Yeah. when you don't eat heavily processed foods. All right, let's go to posture because that was <laughs> that post was great um, because it really got a good discussion going. Mm -hmm. But your original post was basically, and I'm, you know, this is social media, so I know part of what you're doing is like, you get attention, let's start the conversation. Mm. You said something like, if your trainer or coach is doing exercises to correct your posture. They're full of shit. They don't know what they're talking about. Sure, here you go. Anybody who claims to be able to correct your posture either has no fucking idea what they're talking about or is trying to make a lot of money off you because there is no posture that has been definitively shown to be good or bad or to keep you free from injury or pain. So there you go. So explain mm. what you mean by that exactly. And, and what you're seeing that. out there that promoted it. Yeah. yeah. So. This and, is I, what, and I hope I yeah. paraphrased it. No, yeah, you have. Yeah, okay. pr pretty much. Okay. It's just like, because I, one of my biggest pet peeves within this industry, especially the more I get, um, the, like the deeper I got a few years ago when I was in the in the um, very professional space and clinician space, and even more now in the gen pop space, because I see what a lot of the gen pop people are being exposed to is, um, is the misinformation when there is um, very good evidence on both sides around something like posture. And it's diagnosing people as saying, ah, you got anterior pelvic tilt. Ah, you have kyphosis. Ah, you have lordosis. Ah, you have this. This is why you're in pain. This is why you shouldn't be doing this exercise. You don't meet the requirements for this exercise. And it's it's usually usually um, from a well-meaning place because you want people to be lifting as safely as possible and right. want them to be able to use good technique to be able to load up their muscles to get stronger with some kind of longevity and I respect that so we'll come back to that as well but the, the pet peeve that I have is when people take this and a lot of very big influencer accounts um, take this notion and extend it further say hey you have this winged scapula you have this slight scoliosis you have this leg length discrepancy you have anterior pelvic tilt you are now broken you've got to fix mm. that you've got to use these 10 stretches a day this mobility drill you've got to do this exercise you've got to do this before you can squat and what this does is intentional or not but it creates barriers it creates big barriers for the very people that many of us are trying to help which is the gen pop not even the nuanced high level athletes it takes it, now, if you take, take the gen pop clients, if they're now thinking, oh my God, I've got these four postural deficiencies, these issues in my body, and I need to do this half hour, even 10 minutes mobility routine before I can even train and lift in the mm. gym, now that's an extra barrier. And then when they're lifting, they're thinking, oh, am I really... Am I really lifting correctly now that I've got all these issues? I've got this anterior pelvic tilt. I've got this kyphosis. I have this forward head. I've got this X, Y, Z. Am I in danger just be, be, me being in the gym? Am I ready to be lifting with this kind of exercise? And it creates a lot of extra stress and extra fear that for, the, for most people in the gen population, it's unwarranted, especially when you start to look at what evidence shows, not just scientifically, but also anecdotally. When it comes to things like posture, when it comes to things like the the um, individual variances that apply across every single person, even like the, the four or five however many people are in here right now, all of us, we're all going to have very, very different postures. We're all going to have very, very different um, displays of pain, 
of mood, of psychology, but taking it just biomechanically, we're going to have very different postures and very different lifting techniques as well. Where well, there's going to be some commonality around, there's going to be ranges that we, we stay in, but there's a very good chance that if we were all go through different postural assessments, we would be showing up with at least three, if not a dozen different deficiencies or things that could be improved more. And that can create a lot of psychological fear and a lot of um, yeah, barriers to exercise. And then when you look at it from a, a pain perspective, somebody was dealing with an injury or they were dealing with something like lower back pain and they went to go see a clinician who said, ah, your lower back pain is because of your anterior pelvic tilt and it's because of your weak core and it's because of your kyphosis. Now this creates even more fear and in terms of what influences pain, psychology is probably one of the biggest rocks that people aren't looking at trying to invest and trying to allay when it comes to improving people's symptoms of pain because of how complex mm. this whole process is. And that's my big, my big take on that is like, yeah, like I, ca I care about um, posture. I care about technique because I know that, let's say we're doing a deadlift, mm -hmm. for example. I know that a, um, a very rounded back Jefferson curl yeah. <laughs> for it is, Jefferson curl is not a bad exercise, but if I'm trying to do what I would do on a conventional deadlift with the Jefferson curl, I'm probably gonna have a bad time. Yeah. I'm probably gonna have an issue with my overall efficiency and my ability to handle load and tolerance, all that kinds of things. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say one is good or bad. I just say, look, they for different purposes. Yeah. I would say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, um, so I've worked with some really, really good um, physical therapists who I, I think generally are probably some of the best correctional exercise mm -hmm. uh, specialists, generally speaking. And their assessments are are never just posture, right? They, they'll mm. do that, but then they'll take person further through movement and identify, you know, what causes pain, how the person feels, mm -hmm. what is, where they're strong, where they're weak, where they lack uh, mobility. Here's the challenge with pain. And here's mm. my issue with studies on pain. Pain is probably, God, it's one of the most complex subjective things we could measure in science um, because you have the signals of pain, which are objective. So we can measure your pain and you know, your pain receptors and what your brain is sensing and what's happening going on. But what we can't measure, which is the subjective part is your experience of pain. Mm. This is where everything gets really, really weird. Like mm. there's really good studies that'll show that people with low back pain, lots of people with low back pain, the low back pain goes away when they go on SSRI drugs. Mm. So they did no exercise. They did no correctional exercise. They didn't improve their fitness. They went on an antidepressant. My low back pain is a lot better. We have really good evidence showing that trauma can cause physical pain, for example. Mm -hmm. We have lots of evidence where, like I could take 100 random people on the street, do an MRI, and I would probably see two or three times as many discs that were not in right position than I would with people who actually have pain yes. from that. That happens all the time. Or you have people with pain, you do imaging, you do everything, movement, and you're like, everything looks great. What the hell's going on? So this is where I have a challenge with studies that show, there was one study, it's my favorite one, I don't know if you're familiar with this, where they did knee surgeries on half the people, and the other half the people, they actually cut the knee open and then sewed it back up, did no surgery. They had similar results at mm. the end of the study. So the people who thought they had surgery, now I'm not saying knee surgery is a waste of time, but this does illustrate the challenge of like using pain as a measure, well, correcting posture, quote unquote, waste of time because this study shows that. I mean, wow, that's really tough. That's a really tough, because in some cases it is movement. In other mm. cases, it might just be the person feeling more confident. It might just be overall fitness, For sure. or it might be the, empowerment of feeling like they're doing something positive. Well, so it's I wanna, very challenging. Yeah, I want to sum up your argument just so I'm, you know, clear with it in terms of like your issue is mainly di the diagnosis in terms of like what mm -hmm. they're you know, sort of um, pinpointing in terms of like, well, now I have this sickness, right? Like, yes. it's like when you go to the doctor and, and uh, you know, you're, you, you feel these certain symptoms and whatnot. Now all of a sudden you have this, oh, okay, I, I, I'm this person. I identify as this mm -hmm. type of a sickness versus you're not, you don't have any problem with the actual um, addressing like the, the mobility side of it and, and gaining sure. traction in the For joints sure. and actually, you know, uh, getting somebody in, in the right sort of stack where we can now perform movements more effectively and efficiently. Is that correct? Yeah. Cause okay. yeah, from a purely biomechanical perspective, there's always going to be better positions we can tend toward or trend towards to help us lift the heaviest weight with as much volume, frequency, intensity as we can for the longest amount of time possible. That's what we should be striving towards. That will look different person to person. It's always going to be there. And yeah, my biggest thing is this hyper-focus on the diagnosis and saying like, 
you're fragile and that you're broken, that you're fucked up. Yeah. Because um, a lot of the times what I see is it's being used to sell something. Oh, yeah, right. that's, yeah. Well, I mean, off air, we were talking right. about somebody in particular that is exactly like that. They use, they use I mean, they're fear mongering, right? They use, that's what it is, you're yeah. broken. Yeah. I have the, the remedy to fix you and yeah. you need to do this before you can do X, Y, Z. So, okay, n- knowing that, Hmm. But then also being somebody who is pro what Justin was saying as far as getting the joints to be more hmm. mobile. How hmm. do you reconcile that when you're, say, you're training a client and you're yeah, getting... Yeah, what does the protocol look like, I guess, in terms of addressing glaring issues versus just kind of working on strength? Yeah, so um, let's take let's take a specific example to help it help people visualize it. Yeah. Let's, let's someone comes in and they want to deadlift and they can't deadlift with off the ground with good technique from a deadlift perspective. Like their back's really rounded hmm. and... I know, I know from anecdotes and from the um, the science that having a rounded back, even the lumbar spine in motion, in deadlift, isn't going to necessarily cause you pain and make you burst into flames. I probably <laughs> am going to be mindful about how I load that long term and how I progress and how much frequency I give that person. And I do want to get them lifting with a straighter back over time um, because that will mean that from a mechanical perspective, they can handle more load, more frequency, more effort. Um, but if I had that client coming in and I saw ran to their back, and I saw that they were losing posture in that deadlift. They, they rounded up a back and they just, even the lower back round, I thought, oh, okay. I'm not going to tell that person that it's good or bad. I'm going to say, great, cool. In my mind, I'm what I'm going to be mindful of doing then is being, um, being mindful of the load that I use with them, the reps that I use, the range of motion that I use, the speed that I use, and the, how much I push them on that movement. Knowing that from a biomechanical perspective in a very vacuum sense, it's going to be loading their discs more which is not bad. It just means they've got lower tolerance. And that's how I would navigate that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have the discussion where I'd say, this is bad and this is dangerous. What you're doing right now is not, is not ideal. I would just say, hey, for us to be able to handle the load that I want to give you, that I know that you're capable of, and for us to be able to give you the reps, the intensity, the explosiveness, the power that you need, I need to get you over time moving into a better position. Um, I'll then modify that without necessarily telling them that it's good or bad. So just let them lift. Why create the extra fear and stress around how they're currently moving, which they can't fix because it will take time. You know, it's, it's a skill because it could just be a skill thing. It could be a mobility thing, yeah. but it's just pure like just practice it more and practice it within their current constraints in terms of how they can handle it, knowing that I'm definitely loading their discs more than I am their muscles. So yeah. I'll change the loading parameters around and the frequency around that. And then I'll probably give them maybe some regressed, regressed exercises as well or other accessory movements alongside that. And that's where, I, that's where it becomes less about the one exercise in a vacuum, but more about the whole program and how it all how it'll fit. Yeah, I think mm. uh, specifically speaking with the back rounding, if mm. you're if it's the end range of motion for the joint and the joint is supporting the weight, that's when there's an issue. If it's not the end range and the muscles are supporting, then you're probably okay. Um, you know, doing certain types of exercises even without perfect positioning. Where do you see value then in looking at someone's posture mm. and using that as part of your protocol to identify exercises that you may want to start with or focus on? Yeah. Um <laughs> it's a very good question because honestly, it's I don't do much of a postural assessment. I don't do much with that whatsoever. I just make sure when I give a client an exercise, they're able to do it using the muscles that I intend and in the positions that I intend them to get into. So you're watching the movement. Yeah, I'll look at the movement. I'll say, look, you, you're currently, the way that you do this deadlift, it's with a round back and it's definitely loading up into vertebral discs a lot more than I would like. So I need to get you doing it from a regress position to a point, and it could be like a two inch block pull for that person, not because they're a power lifter, but because they're just very immobile and haven't moved much, I'll just start them with that instead. And I'll, I've got in my in my own mind, my, my ideal standard, which you, could call, which you could call an assessment of, here is what's going to biomechanically allow them to load up their hip extensors the most. Here's what's going to allow them to load up their shoulders the most. And can they get into that position? No, they can't. Okay, what if I took a neutral grip? What if I took a decreased range of motion? What if I just took a bit more time with the exercise room to learn the skill? And just build it out from there. Um, but the big thing that I mindful is just I just don't tell, I just don't communicate. I don't, I don't think it matters to tell them that this is good and bad, and that you've currently failed. And this is where you should be. And I say no. Here's here's the exercise for you right now. Here's the program that you got to follow, and here's the level at which you're meant to do this movement in. So, like in a lot of the programs that I run, I have a lot. I have a deadlift, for example, but I'll have ten regressions to it, and I'll tell the client, pick whichever one you need to. Pick, it could be the most basic, um, regressed, low load, small range of motion exercise that mimics their hip hinge lifting carry motion all the way up to 
maybe a deficit snatch grip deadlift being the most advanced exercise. And I let them pick or I help them choose where they currently fit mm. in terms of their ability to load it and do it comfortably and um, experience the beneficial effects of lifting. And then if you can do that, great, go to the next exercise, go to the next exercise and keep going up as they see fit. So what? So an example of like, okay, let's say somebody is squatting and mm. their heels elevate by the time they even get to 90 degrees. They hit yeah. 90 degrees, the heels come up off the ground. Now, is your answer to that to just elevate the heels and keep them squatting, or are you going to address ankle mobility at all? So that's an interesting one. By elevating the heels, okay, people see that as a Band-Aid. That will actually improve over time their ability to push their knees forward from a neurological perspective because of how it shifts their center of mass. Sure. And that will actually have a big impact on the ankle mobility as well. So I will do that, but I'll also add in things. I'll say, you know what, you can't squat right now because your heels lift off so much. I'll give some heel elevated, maybe anterior loaded squats that'll help to address that in terms of the actual squat motion. But I'll also will give you some split squats. I'll give you like, if somebody can't squat past 90 degrees that the heels lifting off, I'm still very confident that if I give them a front foot elevated split squat and I had a very high elevation, they'll be able to push that knee, assuming no injury, they'll be able to push that knee very, very far forwards into that ideal position for ankle mobility. Yeah. And I'll have that as their exercise. So in terms of my continuum, maybe the barbell back squat flat foot with a high bar position, upright posture, that will be the gold standard in this mobility sense. And then the most, most, most regressed exercise from that might be a very high elevation, like a above your knee elevation, front foot elevated split squats with some anterior load to help that you stay more upright and really drive that knee forwards, maybe even with heel elevation. And then over time, decrease the elevation, decrease the whole front foot elevation, change the loading pattern, get mm. them squatting on both feet, barbell on their back, flat foot, and it builds them up. What I think a mistake would be, would be to say, oh, you can't squat right now. Let's keep you trying to squat and let's do all these extra mobility things as well. Because mm. then we're adding in a whole bunch of other stuff instead of just saying, is the, is the issue really with um, the mobility? Yeah, it is. But how can we address that by not overwhelming them and making them hyper-focus on things that may be inefficient from the efficiency perspective. So I'll say, I'll, instead of giving you a squat, I'll just give you this exercise that you can execute elegantly. Um, I always look at it from a skill acquisition. And if yeah. the client doesn't have the skill right now, what skill do they currently have? Bring it back to that. And then build them towards towards that ideal as well. And that I, may involve mobility. I like that answer. The only thing that I found that's challenging with that and why I like to to isolate something like that and focus, like say I would I would prime them before mm. and do mm. like a combat stretch. Mm. And the reason why I would oppose to the direction that you went, because I don't disagree, is that I found in my experience that uh it's hard to get a client uh, to cue them to do what I want them to do. So if I just put them in the right. lunge, they'll still go to that in range that's comfortable. Yeah. And either the heel comes up or they won't they won't yeah. let the knee travel where I'm trying to get them to challenge and push mm. that knee forward because I want I want I want it from a neurological level to get reconnected and go, hey, I want us to be comfortable with that knee going forward. So I'm just going to focus on that, driving that knee forward and I want you to connect. Now when we go into your exercise, I want you to think about that. I just have found I've had better success by isolating that first and then taking them to the exercise versus just modifying the exercise and then hoping that that new modification will over time get them to do yeah, that. Yeah, I, I like that. I think that's applicable to a lot of people. I think yeah. that's going to work well where they, um, no matter how much changes you give them exercise-wise, they're still going to screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's People are fallible like that. Yeah. Um, I've found both to, to hold true where like, there will be some people and it usually does become t the complete complete first timer where they really just need um, that very low load stretch combat to help them prime that area and, yeah. and be, oh, this is what it feels like, have my knee going forwards. Yeah. Um, what I also find is if I just, if I elevate the heel enough, it forces their knee forwards yeah. on a split squat, for example. And that could be, it will be it actually in like the exact same position of a combat stretch, if front foot elevated, yeah. heel elevated. You can't not you can't do a front foot elevated heel squat with a uh, sorry front foot elevated split squat with that heel elevated. Mm. You can't do that and get your hamstring touching your calf without your knee traveling over your toes. Yeah. It's like it becomes kind of biomechanically impossible yeah. unless if they're really, really, <laughs> really messed up. Yeah. <laughs> so you well, found I it think as a way both to both directions, I mean the commonality there is the time it takes for them yeah. to learn and acquire the skill yeah. of stabling their ankle properly. Absolutely. In, in that range of motion. And so it's not Again, it's a different mindset in that same, uh, same outcome. goal. And yeah. if you want to add in that combat stretch or four of the stretches, it's 
hey, go for it. Like it's not it's not, not going to hurt them. Yeah. It's not a negative yeah. thing. Yeah, so that's, like, this is why absolutely. I hate social media because you, you do a post and a video and it's like, you know, 100 words in a short yeah. video and th- you can't possibly explain all of this in, mm. a, in a social media post. That's why mm. podcasts are so great because we talk yeah. about this forever. Do you think, here's something that I, this is a bit of controversy and I don't know if people are saying this because it sounds counter and it gets attention or if they actually believe this or so. Do you think a deadlift is a good back hypertrophy exercise. Because I hear people arguing, it's yeah. not a back exercise, it's a hip <laughs> exercise. And I get the biomechanics, but yeah. for anybody who's ever deadlifted for a long time, I think they might disagree, or at least a lot of people. I mean, what do you think about? Yeah. So um, it comes down to definitions. What do we define as back? Are we talking um, the lats, the traps, the rhomboids? They're only ever going to be working isometrically over, through a very, very small range of motion. So they, they are going to receive some hypertrophy stimulus because you can grow muscle isometrically as you guys, I know you guys have a isometric based program as yeah. well. Um, it's like, that's going to build muscle. So of course you can. Um, your spinal erectors, they're definitely going through a range of motion there. <laughs> they're definitely under load. They're going to grow. And I would call them back. So I'd say, yeah, it's, it's a back hypertrophy exercise. I wouldn't categorize the deadlifts as the same back. I wouldn't, if I'm yeah, picking back exercises, I wouldn't put them in the same category as a pull up or a row. Because we're working different muscles now, you know. Um, the deadlift still does work those muscles, but it doesn't take them through the same range of motion from a, a movement or a hypertrophy force production perspective as a pull down, pull up, um, row, whatever other exercise you might want to do because it's a static exercise. So it just comes down to, again, the context and the nuance and how you define things. And if you were to completely categorize just the deadlift and say, what is the prime mover? being what muscles contribute the most to performing that hip hinge, hip extension pattern. Um, it it has to be the glutes, adductors, hamstrings, yeah. bit of yeah. quads as well. Um, but to say that it's not a back exercise is, I'd say it's clickbait. Yeah. I'd say it's also from poor understanding, trying to get <laughs> attention. It's, um, it's oversimplifying things for the sake of attention, whether it's intentional or not. You know, it's, it's a lot of monkey see, monkey do parroting out there. Hey, this coach says not, it's a bad dead, it's a bad back exercise. Yeah. Like I'm going to give people a deadlift to improve their back strength. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, what's weird about it though. I'll say this. Um, I've trained enough people to know that it is isometric in some extent. It was very sh- limited range of motion. Hmm. You're going to get some ramp, you know, rhomboid and trap. Hmm. Uh, you know, range of motion because you maybe your scapula is a little more spread at the top. You bring them together. Mm-hmm. Your lats at the bottom, obviously, as you come up, the arms come closer to the body. So there's some little bit more range of motion that's isometric. But man, in my experience, uh, it's like a, a great just overall muscle builder for the entire back. The and lo- it might be the load. It's the load. It's 100 percent the load. What? Uh, what? Uh, show me a person who's uh, rowing. Uh, anywhere near what they deadlift or pull doing a pull up of anywhere. <laughs> so even though it's mostly isometric or shortened range of motion, I think it's just, the load is so dramatic that you get this incredible stimulus out of it that you just wouldn't get. What other isometric do you get where you can where it's yeah. that heavy? Mm-hmm. That's what makes it so unique and why why I do think it's such a great back exercise. To your point you made earlier though, where in the hell would I ever not use other exercises to Absolutely. complement the back. Like yeah. it'd be that might be ridiculous. the whole thing, right? The whole argument of this versus that. It's like, why not both? Like, yeah. You know, I mean, tacos exactly. or pizza. Yeah. I like but what, I mean, I think the, the point of you bringing that up and why it's a good discussion for all of us to talk about is because there are people on social media that have tried to, you know, discredit it as a good back exercise. And it's like, no, anybody who's heavy deadlifted has developed what do you, a back from What do you that. think about the systemic uh, effect of some exercise because obviously you do an exercise as a localized effect, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So the target muscle hypertrophy, CNS, very targeted. But there's also kind of the systemic effect yeah. that you get, like like a farmer's walk, a heavy farmer's walk. Okay, I never program those in my workouts. I I did them with clients, but I never really did it myself until maybe a few years ago. We did a program called Map Strong that we wrote with. Uh, Robert Oberst is the strongest man competitor. And Mm -hmm. it's part of the programming because in strongman competitions, you often do a farmer's walk, right? Yes. So it's in the program. And I did them. I followed the program. I did them. And and my arms grew from Mm -hmm. doing a farmer's walk. uh, And I don't know if it was a load or my explanation. And again, I don't think we have any science to explain this yet. Maybe we will. But I feel like it was a systemic CNS activation. My whole body had to stay tense. And the load was so heavy. Like, what do you think about that? And, and is you know, is there anything that you found with clients or with yourself where um, kind of points to something? Well, for one thing, I mean, you're also just going to have a um, a genetic component. 
You've got great arms, Sal. Sure. You really do. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, that. I feel like you could do calves and your arms will just grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like I think that's what happens when he, I think that's what happens when he does calves actually. <laughs> arms just grew from calves. So um so like there are for again, reasons that we probably don't understand, or at least I don't understand to any degree, but there are gonna be hyper responsive muscle groups no matter what you do in terms of exercise. It's just having the anabolic signaling coming out from your brain and having the anabolic hormones soaking through your system sure. on a genetic level. Some muscles are responding. They're, they're just going to grow. You know, like like my calves, they just they just grow. Okay, yeah, They I, just I grew the opposite. Yeah, you like, do arms, you calves grow. They're growing right now. Like, just yeah. sitting here. They've another inch, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm I wore jeans for you guys today. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate what, that. What are some, okay, thinking back to your, your, your journey, okay, from being just a, a young fitness kid to getting into coaching, and, and acquiring all your knowledge, what were some of the, the the greatest you know paradigm shifting moments for you as far as like things that you thought to be true and then it just blew your mind? You're like, Hang oh. on, before I get that, I've got to answer Sal's question. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so Sal's just like, yeah, come uh, on, man, just Adam, fucking <laughs> Adam stopped it because he started complimenting my arms. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. You want to right. shut that down? Yeah, yeah. you don't need more. He's politician. That's enough. That's enough. Right there. His head barely fits the door already. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's more. He's kissing his biceps. Anyway, Every continue. My yeah. arms. Yeah. So from the, <laughs> tell me more. Like, I'll put some oil on for the next yeah. next ad break. <laughs> um, systemically, yeah, there's going to be um, some exercise, like maybe a deadlift that just has such a potent stimulus on your nervous system that just tells your entire body, hey, we've got to build some muscle. Yeah. And yeah. then your body will indiscriminately just put muscle wherever it can. And it will probably bias the muscle growth towards what is under the most load, which probably be in a deadlift, glutes, hamstrings, erectors, adductors, quads maybe. Sure. But there's going to be some that will go to your arms, so your delts, even your chest, even though they're not prime movers. And let's say that your chest is just a very good responder to muscle building anabolic signals. There's no reason why I can't grow a ton from a deadlift, even despite it not being a prime mover. I still wouldn't call the deadlift a chest exercise, sure, yeah. <laughs> even if someone saw that response from it. But that's probably what's going on there. Is systemically, your brain receives a signal of saying, holy fuck, we better build some muscle mass right now. Let's just build up that machinery. And if for whatever random genetic variance you have a response in your chest, it might grow some. It might not grow as much as your glutes, hamstrings, erectors being the prime movers there, but they'll receive some stimulus. So it makes sense to me that your arms would grow on a farmer's walk or a deadlift, despite they're not going through much yeah. of a range of motion. But then the other, the next extension to that question is also going to be about um, – how do we bounce? Like, would you then program for you personally? Would you then want to program farmers' walks on your arm day? Would you program sure. that for everybody else, generally speaking, as an arm exercise? You you wouldn't. You'll say like, if you want to grow arms, you're going to do curls, you're going to do dips, you're going to do pull ups, you're going to do rows, you're going to do other actual flexion movement based exercises instead. Um, but that wouldn't discount the fact that farmers' carries have or delves have helped be an anabolic thing for your arms. Mm. Uh, but it just comes down to how you define that. Because if you gave everybody, based on your experience, a farmer's carry or a deadlift as, the, as their arm day exercise, they're probably not going to grow. <laughs> and they're probably going to get very systemically and neurologically fatigued, which will then impact on their ability to actually create local fatigue in the tissue that they want to grow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a really good, um, really good question and experience yeah. from yourself as well. Yeah. Oh, I think there's, I think there's a, a novelty thing there too. I yes. think because it's such a different stimulus, and mm. I think that um, part of why we wrote a program that was centered around isometrics. I also remember during COVID, you were doing a bunch of stuff, and I remember that was another time that I was pointing people in your direction because I think isometrics have fallen out of favor. Yeah. Nobody talks about them, and there's tremendous benefit. Oh, the studies around it are incredible. Yeah. yeah. And so there's an, a, a lot of your traditional programming that's done that's out there online just doesn't include a lot of isometrics and there's an isometric component to you doing farmer carries mm -hmm. yeah. and you're doing it very loaded so mm. I think that being novel and there's getting a lot the of heavy force demand that you're yeah. trying to sustain yeah. versus yeah. You know, so even, I, I, even I, I think so. there's a, your genet your point to the genetic component the overall systemic yeah. what you guys are saying really and like then also answer. the novelty mm. of probably not training a lot of isometric like exercises yeah. Sure. I, yeah, I really like your answer and you know back to isometrics um, it's hard to find actually a training modality with many studies isometrics have been studied heavily yeah especially in the in the soviet union this is obviously before the uh, the iron curtain came down mm -hmm. they used them quite a bit to train their olympic and they dominated obviously in strength yeah. sports and I, it did fall out of favor and i think it's because you don't use any fancy equipment for it yeah but i mean i can't think of a safer it's actually one hard of the to safest, sell shit with yeah. it <laughs> it's one of the safest ways to exercise and yeah. although it doesn't the strength gains from it don't continue because uh, mm. it kind of plateaus very quickly. The strength gains are very fast initially. Yes. Um, and it doesn't 
like require a 15 degree carryover, uh, it, it, you know, and, of force transfer. Yeah, and, there, and it doesn't require a ton of recovery. So it's like mm -hmm. this wonderful tool you can add to your routine and see gains right away. But it did fall out of favor. I, I think it's the equipment thing. It just you can't sell yeah. a lot of fans. Do what do you think? I think. Um one thing, it's equipment where there are a couple of um, really cool devices. I wish I knew the names of them. I've got to find them. Um, these isometric devices we can set up for every single muscle group, different isometric mm. movements. And um, they usually, but it's usually geared more towards rehabilitation. Yeah. yeah. Like a lot of the research that people use for isometrics and a lot of the applications, unfortunately, it gets, it's, it hyper focuses on the safety of them because yeah. they yeah, a great regression for movements. And then people forget that, hang on, they're also a great way for strength athletes to improve their power, their speed, their force production, their activation, motor units. Um, but that people focus on the rehab side, they go, oh, it's fluffy. Also, I think it's just, it's fucking hard. Like if you're it doing is. like an extended it's not max much reward isometric, to it yeah. it's really hard. Yeah, to do. Like even, just, even just a 10 second max hold. You got to have a gun to head to really get to that complete max output. It's it's challenging, and I think that's part of where it falls out of favor. Um, there's a lot of just different variables there, but I think probably a big one is honestly equipment yeah. and the um, and the ability to make a sales thing out yeah. of it. Yeah. Well. yeah, it doesn't look sexy. It's hard right? to sell what, people on yeah, it. What's yeah. the guy doing? He's not moving. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I think all you used was a towel, right? I use a towel. Like, yeah. So buy my buy my ebook now. Yeah. <laughs> you got you got a towel. You got a gym. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, you so, know, there's there, another great technique. I'd love your opinion on. Um, I, you know who Paul Anderson was? One of the great greatest weightlifters of all yes, time. Yes, yes, He's an yes, American yes. weightlifter. Yes. This guy was incredibly strong. This is pre-anabolic steroids, or maybe there were, but they definitely weren't using what they what they use later on. Yeah. And he would do something called an Anderson squat, which we now, I think we now call a, uh, we might call it like a dead squat or whatever, but he would get, so without the, I don't know, what's the term? Is it the stretch reflex or the stretch loading when you lower a weight and then come back up? Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, stretch reflex. Yeah. yeah. Yep. He would get under a bar already mm. at the bottom, and lift it from there without right. lowering it. Which, if you've ever tried this, you're not nearly as strong yeah. as when you lower a weight. And he would do this, and it was one of the keys that he said to his strength. I know some athletes that do this, and it it's tremendous. I used it to gain literally 30 pounds on my squat years ago, where I would load the bar on the bottom of the rack, mm. get underneath it, get in my position, and then take off. And it made my normal squat go through the roof. Do you have you ever tried using these and uh, or or any kinds of variations of this type of training? And what do you yeah, think is happening sure. there? I think um, yeah, I've used it a lot in the past when I was doing a lot of powerlifting and strength based work, and I think it has a lot of application. I mean, if you look at a um, how most people would do like their max deadlift or close to a max deadlift, usually say we're doing saying they're doing a double, a heavy two, true two rep max. Usually the second rep is better than the first yeah. rep. And why is that? It's usually because they've had that eccentric component to find a better position. Mm. And then they get, because people suck. And There's even, some energy loaded yeah. and saved and then that's there what they might say, be, right? There Elastic might be as well. Potential. It definitely is part of that. But even if, they, even if they did a complete dead stop and are like a bit of a relax, neurologically their body, their brain knows how to get into a slightly better position because of that lowering uh, component. Yeah, sure. And then it's like, okay, now I can get into a better position for, for rep number two. Um, and even that happens to a lot of very, very, very advanced top level deadlifters where um, like that's their common issue is my second rep is always better than the first rep. Yeah. And it's like, well, how do I do the first, how do I do the second rep first? Just do that one instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, but well, I think what's going on with squats is when you start the Anderson squat in the bottom there, it's forcing you to learn positionally where the best position is because you don't get the eccentric time on the lowering phase to work that out for yourself. Um, and then definitely there is a whole stretch reflex where you get rid of that elastic energy. So it is more of a an, an honest squat, I guess, in inverted commas. Um, and just the, the amount of recruitment it takes to go from a complete dead start in terms of motor unit recruitment, your brain has to work a lot more efficiently and effectively to go from a dead start as opposed to getting yeah. that lowering component. So there's a yeah. few different mechanisms going on there. What, what would you consider for, for you one of the most underrated uh, but valuable training techniques would mm. you say it would be isometrics or is it yeah. something else honestly it's, it's been like for the last 10 years it's been isometrics it's been whether it's for a rehab perspective whether it's from a conditioning like a perspective for like the capillaries like the blood vessels it could be your isometrics it whereas from max strength like the anderson style squat or even just a pause squat or just a even a max isometronic like bruce lee style um isometrics in whatever application may be whether it's extended for like five minutes or it's a short 10 second thing i think isometrics are very very under underutilized they're used a lot in very nuanced applications like rehab or for the yeah. very elite sporting people mm -hmm. but the gen pop can benefit so much just from utilizing that even from a technique perspective 100 you know, yeah one of the of, easiest of one of the easiest ways advanced ways to do this and i've talked about this on the show so i hope people try this with their home gyms is you can literally anchor two chains into the concrete make them sure they're very very well anchored put collars 
have have attachments for collars and I could set up a barbell on it at different varying lengths. So I could get underneath it and squat. Obviously I'm not going to move mm. or I could press or I could yes. row yes. at max effort. The strength gains from that come so fast and furious. It's ridiculous. Like literally yeah. if you practice that by the second week and then you go do your traditional lifts, you're going to be like 10 pounds stronger on a yeah, lot of lifts. It's, it's incredible. I mean, that, and that, that was a lot of what Bruce Lee would do. I mean, yeah. Isometric work. Yeah, I'm a huge fan, and, by the way. And yeah. And um, and that's where, like, that's, I'll, I'll use a towel. <laughs> Just yeah. to, again, you, you got to have a pretty long towel to be able to squat with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you better get into the ground, anchored on the ground. Um, but any, like, I used to actually use a lot of um, gymnastic rings, the straps. That's the perfect way to create an anchor point. Yeah. You wrap that around yourself, put it on your shoulders, step on it so you can't lift it up and just, just squat or do a deadlift position. And that would be yeah, similar kind of findings yourself. It will really ramp up your motor unit recruitment, which will carry over to your actual movement mm -hmm. exercise after. Great way to very quickly supercharge your strength. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot, e going back to the original question that I asked you that yeah. we left, um, yeah. you know, this is good on this topic, like these techniques and what are some things that, you know, you've changed your mind about in during your lifting career or things that were paradigm shattering for yeah. you? Biggest one, 100% conditioning, conditioning cardiovascular work. Oh. Again, like growing up, I was a bodybuilder and cardio is seen as a way to lose fat. Mm -hmm. And I lost a lot of fat doing a lot of cardio. Like I, my, for my first bodybuilding show, I had to drop about, um, about 45, 50 pounds of fat. Yeah. And it was done in my opinion through like it's calorie deficit, but my mech, the way that I implemented it was doing like three hours, four hours of cardio a day. Oh my God. <laughs> like Every not, day? Not from day one, yeah. but it was, it yeah. started out, you know, 30 minutes a day. And then it went to 40 minutes a day. Yeah. And then, okay, an hour is kind of boring. Let's do, let's do an hour in the morning and let's do maybe 20 minutes at night. And then it went, it got to three hours, wow. four hours. It, it, it was not good. Somehow I balanced uni and working as a PT and my actual weight training in between. <laughs> I, I don't know how. how? I, don't, I, I don't know how. Like, Man, you, you know, must hold on to muscle really well. I, I, would, I did I not. Would, I lost uh, a lot of muscle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind. Was not very successful. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, yeah, I lost, I lost all my muscle. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's a catch there. Um, but yeah, in my head, like cardio is for fat loss. Yeah. In the off season, when you're trying to build muscle, you're trying to build strength, you don't do cardio, yeah. you don't do conditioning work because it's going to decrease your gains. And then I started um, learning a lot more about conditioning and cardio. And obviously the fact is like, hey, cardio is about not eliciting a calorie deficit. It's not about energy burn. It's not about fat loss. It's literally about training your cardiovascular system, oh, beautiful. your heart, your blood vessels, your lungs. Yes. And that has applications for muscle building. Like if you take all of us right now, let's say we want to put on as much muscle as we can. Like we want to get fucking jacked. I want to put on 30 pounds in the next 30 days, okay? Right. Apart from steroids. <laughs> um, D-ball. Yeah, like that, that's that's the protocol, right? Yeah. We're going to use a lot of Anadrol and D-ball. Give me 30 <laughs> days, dude. Yeah. 30 days. Yeah, and burgers. Um, yeah. If we can, we all have our idea of what the program or the anabolic stack or whatever would be that would help us out. But if you took all of us and put us through the exact same protocol of all those drugs and all those training, we'll get a response. But if we took our exact identical twin, but that person had a better VO2 max, a more intricate capillary network, or more robust heart, lung, blood vessel, all that kind of cardiovascular system, if you took that person and put the exact same protocol on them, they'll probably put on 60 pounds, not 30 pounds. Yeah, I, I, I love what you just said because my issue or our issue with cardio is making that the fundamental way that you try to lose body fat, which we've mm. talked about many times is really not a really the good manual long calorie burn. Yeah, yeah it's not only. a really good long term yeah. approach. And in in the the if I really get boil down the root of what annoys me about that is that we value, or I should say the mainstream values exercise based off of its calorie burn. This is how we've yeah. ranked exercise for so long. Oh, we got to burn more calories. What's the best form of exercise? The one that burns the most calories, which is terrible because we ignore the most important thing about exercise, which are the adaptations, which is what mm -hmm. you're talking about. Yeah. And I agree hundred percent with you. Um, when I have better stamina, I can lift weights better. Yeah. When my stamina is crap, I can't lift weights that great. Like you yeah. try to do a set of 20 reps of squats, which is great for building the legs mm -hmm. with poor stamina. Mm -hmm. You're dead. You can't do <laughs> yeah. it. So I, I completely agree with you. So yeah. 100%. What are your favorite forms of conditioning? Do you just steady state or do you like hit or like it, for- Yeah, it varies. So, I mean, there's there's so many layers to how you can program conditioning. People normally think of it as hit or list and they think of it as- being on a treadmill or maybe mix it up and go into a spin bike or maybe mix it up and go into mm -hmm. an air bike or a rower. But really conditioning can also be how you perform your weights. Like there's no, like we, yeah. we identify conditioning by its exercise choice of running right. or jogging or cardio exercises, but conditioning should be and determined based upon the work to rest interval, mm -hmm. the duration and the overall intensity that yeah. you use. And because of that, you can use 
any exercise. You know, you can use deadlifts, you can use an overhead squat or whatever. So it really comes down to um, yeah, how you apply the exercises. So that will then become individual dependent. What I personally will do will be based upon how it fits into what else I'm currently doing. Mm. So when it comes to programming for conditioning, the um, the first thing I want to ask is, do I want to be, am I focusing on this particular session? Am I focusing on aerobic conditioning or anaerobic conditioning? Because they're slightly different things in yeah. terms of the overall duration of it. And that will then determine, okay, how long is it going to be? And what's the relative intensity? That will then determine what exercises are going to make the most sense. Like if I'm doing a... Um, um, an all-out anaerobic 20-second burst, like 20 seconds on and a minute off for like 10 sets. That's going to have a very specific anaerobic conditioning stimulus on my body. It's also going to predicate me towards certain exercises where maybe something like more plyometric-based exercises are a really bad choice because I'm going to be very sore. Yeah. There's higher injury risk. It's going to damage my ability to be able to do higher frequencies of that to create more adaptations. Um so, and then when will I, why would I do that over doing more of a steady state long duration? It may be because I need to improve my max power output and my ability to handle things like lactate, my hand, my ability to handle myself working at a maximum intensity under fatigue conditions. That's a very different adaptation to what I'm going to get from the zone two cardio, the right. low intensity stuff is going to work more on the mitochondrial side of things, it's going to work more on the, um, just the overall blood flow and the stroke volume, the, the heart side of things, the adaptations there. So I think the the mistake people make is they they argue between hit or list. Hit you're gonna get the afterburn. List you're gonna get the yeah. the lower intensity. But you, the reality is you need both, and they support each other. They're gonna help each other. So we should be doing plenty of both styles of training. You can't just do lists, even though it helps with your it's gonna help you for recovery. It's going to over time not let you learn how to push hard under a fatigue state at a maximal intensity at a max heart rate. You can only get that from doing true anaerobic intervals. And you can't even get that from doing weightlifting. You can't get that from a, even a hard set of like a true grinder, 15 rep set of squats. You're not going to practically be able to do that enough to be able to get the anaerobic stimulus that you need from just doing a few hard sets in the gym. Because technically speaking, I could do a 20 second all out burst, one minute off, 10 sets, that's going to give me the anaerobic benefits of training under fatigue conditions. I could do the same thing on a squat. I could do a 20 rep set of squats. That might take me 20, 30 seconds. My eyeballs will be bursting out. I could take a minute rest, do it again. The issue there is as I do more sets to accumulate the required volume to create the adaptation for conditioning for the anaerobic stimulus, it's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. dangerous, it's impractical. Yeah. So eventually, whether you like it or not, we all should be doing some um, cardio work that is probably going to be on a cardio-based machine in the anaerobic threshold and also in that low intensity threshold to supplement and support our weightlifting because you can't get the same adaptations across all these different things from the one implement. And that's what we should be looking at. Yeah. I agree. How much of that are you programming in a week typically? Yeah. You know, a generic um, answer, obviously. So um, if, if I really want to drive up the adaptations to improve the, the benefits for recovery in a certain cycle of training for myself right now, it would be Every day I'll be doing some kind of conditioning, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic. I might usually flip flop between, this, yeah. between the two, so maybe three days of each a week. Um, my weight training will will take a back seat. Mm. I might only train twice a week for doing like pure strength work because I can't handle all the extra cardio work I'm doing. But it's okay because train train two days a week. Are you going to lose muscle mass? Such, no. a, such a good point yeah. that you just did. You yeah. just said that right there because yeah, I think everybody the mistake, just adds. Yeah, the ad. that's the Don't mistake add. that I think yeah. most people would make, and then they end up losing losing muscle because of how much they're they're throwing. For sure, it yeah, for sure. But it's like, well, what's what's my main priority right now? My main priority right now is to drive the cardiovascular adaptations. I need to do aerobic and anaerobic stuff. I need to do it probably most days because it doesn't take a lot of soreness, doesn't take a lot of recovery from us. I'll do it every single day, but. Neurologically, I maybe probably can't perform as much in my weight sessions. I'll do less there. But again, realistically, mechanistically, am I going to lose a lot of strength and muscle mass training twice a week with weights? I'm not. No. It's going to, at absolute worst, it might come down 10%, yeah, which but would, it'll come back right, overnight. Right, right, yeah, right. that's the beauty of strength training is that you you such a small amount is required to maintain what you mm. built versus mm. what you did. Yeah. Not necessarily true with other forms of exercise. I know with cardiovascular exercise, the, the more, I mean, obviously the, mm. you can't keep doing this, but the more, the better. Strength training is really interesting. Like, uh, especially I've been working out for so long now that I can keep muscle really easy. Like if yeah. I just worked out twice a week, yeah. I wouldn't get any, I wouldn't lose any muscle or strength, uh, mm. but I wouldn't have built any 
with yeah. just, you know, or get to this point, uh, which is two days a week. So yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah. And uh, the cardio is interesting as well because it, it is kind of similar where once you spend like a good four, eight, maybe 12 week block of doing this dedicated conditioning style work, you've created changes to your heart. Like your left ventricle has grown. You've, 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 you've created more blood vessels. You've, you've changed your body on a, uh, on a cellular level. That's not going to change overnight either. Like yeah. you, once I've done that block of say even just four weeks of doing a lot of conditioning, I'll probably come back to just two sessions a week. Like I'll do one extended, like one hour, 90 minute session mm-hmm. and I'll do one 15 minute anaerobic session and that'll be enough to maintain and then I can ramp up the weight training and it'll maintain for a while, but eventually there is going to be slow diminishing returns, slow diminishing benefits to it and then I'll need to ramp it back up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like we know for all of us training two days a week with weights is enough to maintain, but for how long? Yeah. If, we, if we trained just two days a week for the next five years, we're definitely going to be a bit smaller, a bit weaker every yeah, time. Sure. Yeah, sure. So we've got to find, take a while. Yeah, we've got to find where is that point where <clears throat> what's the minimum effective dose of cardio that I can do to maintain where I'm currently at? And then when I see it decreasing as well, I need to add more back in again. It's always ebb and flow, push and pull. So good. That's, that's programming yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about the the like full body versus body part split? Um, debate that you often see. I remember yeah. for me, that was a, really a game changer. Um, and we talk about on the show why, and it's not necessarily the frequency because you could do a body part split and still hit the body parts two or three days a week, mm. but rather it was just the, the exercise selection tended to be better because I'm doing yeah. less volume per body part. And if I missed the workout, I didn't miss, you know, the legs, legs or whatever, the, the body parts I like to miss or whatever. So, I mean, what, what is your experience on that? And do you have yeah. a preference? I, I personally prefer for most people, um, this is gen pop and advanced people. I usually try to trend towards more of a full body or a blended body part mm. thing, as opposed to arm day, shoulder day, back yeah. day. And that's actually not how I grew up. I grew up doing body part splits. Yeah, so I grew up doing did. bro yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then I realized that, Hey, it's, it's overkill. And I'm doing 10 exercises for back and they're all good exercises. I'm pushing them all hard, but at some point the stimulus just keeps going down Mm -hmm. the fatigue starts going up. So the whole full body or half body upper lower splits, they're designed to try to find this balance between stimulus and fatigue and saying, how much do we really need to stimulate muscle growth or strength or whatever the adaptation is versus how much more would I add on that would then create extra fatigue. And that's why I think there's a magic in full body work is it forces you to really be intelligent about how you choose exercises and how you direct that hard stimulus because you only have one exercise for say back on that one day. So you got to make sure it's a good exercise. You wouldn't necessarily pick pick deadlifts for your lat hypertrophy on on that full body workout. You'll think more of a pull up. You'll think more of a pull down or a row instead. And you'll do deadlifts maybe as a hip extensor posterior chain on the other full body day that you do. Um, so it kind of forces you organically to be smarter about exercise selection and also be smarter about how you, how you really push yourself and make sure you're giving yourself an honest effort. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Spoken like someone who's trained a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Also very practical too. You know, when yeah. you think of the average gin pop, the person, you know, who goes a whole year and doesn't miss weeks here and there of training. And mm. if you miss a couple of days in a week and you only got in one day, at least you got a full body routine and you didn't miss yeah. certain body parts. So that's why yeah. I really like it. Yeah. Too. So mm-hmm. what, what annoys you the most right now about, uh, I guess the mainstream, I don't know, social media fitness space, it, it changes all the time. Yeah. So one minute they say this and the minute this is the popular thing. Is there anything right now that you're, you're seeing that's kind of popular that where you're just, you want to roll your eyes? It, it's less about actual, um, like what people are saying. Because it's always going to be a shit that pisses me off. But it's actually <laughs> more about the platforms. It's more about the the whole general culture uh. of people and society as a whole on a, on a meta level. And honestly, it is TikTok. Oh. It, it's, oh, yeah. And it's not just because TikTok's a new platform, but it's it's actually what I've noticed that it creates, what, what it breeds mm-hmm. in terms of the population. Like I, I can put something up on Instagram or I can put it up, I can put the same video up on YouTube and it will create a fair bit of discussion. It'll create like people are saying, yeah, talk to me more about this or I disagree with you. Let mm-hmm. me tell you why I disagree with you. And we have discussions around that. You post it on TikTok, no one has their discussions. Mm-mm. Instead, it's just about, I'm going to tag my favorite influencer because I want them to tear you down. I want want that person to give their opinion. I don't want to give my opinion myself. I just want to just sit back in my voyeuristic little chamber. Yeah, and just and watch a reality talk show or reality show Kardashians with Eugene and and Mind Pump Adam instead. (laughs) And it and it's it creates a very, very different um uh platform, I guess. Uh, a diff- very different arena where discussion and nuanced things and bu- uh, and information can no longer thrive. And it yeah. is more just about egos and arguing yeah. and controversy. And 
I don't think it's necessarily social media to blame because, hey, YouTube, Instagram, it creates a lot of really good traction for me personally in terms of good discussions. But it's TikTok specifically where I, I've i always got to just like, whew, take a deep breath, Eugene, <laughs> use TikTok for what it is in terms of ga- gaining engagement, gaining not discussions yeah. and not even back and forth yeah. with anybody. It's just like putting stuff out so people know who you are yeah. and yeah. just walk away from it because I get too pissed off. <laughs> you, you know, that's why when we first got together, we wanted to do a podcast because, mm. and at the time, podcast, I mean, straight up, this is almost eight years ago, mm. I think, seven, eight years ago. I, you To ask people, hey, do you listen to podcasts? I swear to God, 50% of them would ask you, what a, what's a podcast? Yeah. Okay, so it wasn't the most popular but we chose podcast over Instagram and other media because we know that fitness and health and nutrition and wellness and fat loss and all that stuff is a conversation. Like I've never trained a client and gotten through to them accurately with 50 words or yeah. like a post. It was always like a conversation that we had over time. And that's why we enjoyed podcasts. This was an hour, two hours. We could talk about this, mm-hmm. discuss like we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. Nuances. Do you have any, do you have a podcast by the way? Are you no. any, any, <laughs> any, any ideas in the future? <laughs> I feel like you're, you're well suited for it because talking <laughs> yeah. to you on the podcast is I, you can really discuss all these nuances yeah. versus um, you know, um, social media. Even Instagram is really tough and YouTube gives you more, more time, but yeah. Like I know probably behind me, Katrina is just laughing because <laughs> literally every, every other day and every person I meet, they're like, you should do a podcast. Yeah. Sure. And yeah. this goes on for years. Well, we don't say people. this to a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't yeah. tell you. Yeah. Yeah. We, we'd um, rather people don't put yeah. out more podcasts. Yeah. 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 Um, for me personally, I, I shoot myself in the foot a lot because um, I have one of my big limits holding me back is like, I see what you guys have. And I'm like, man, this is fucking cool. If I did a podcast, I don't want to do it over Zoom. I don't want to do it over Skype. I want to do it in person. I want to mm-hmm. have a proper facility where I'm running something, yeah. which which I do have. Like I got my own my own private mm-hmm. gym, my own private where I could film things like this. Um, but I also know that I um, I feel like I wouldn't be upkeeping if it was just me on my own, where I would need, you know, you got a group of guys, you can b- dance off each other. If it was just the Adam show, just the Justin show, you probably... S- you wouldn't run out of ideas, but you would find it hard to It keep wouldn't be as popular, I'll tell you yeah. that right now. <laughs> and, and it'd, be hard, <laughs> it'd be awful, dude. It'd be hard yeah, if you to keep would. showing up as well. Yeah. But, yeah. but there are guys like, you know, Ben Greenfield, who's got his own podcast. He does all his own stuff and he yeah. just pumps it out and that's, that's his thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For me, personality-wise, doing it on my own is not a good fit. So I'm like, okay, what would I personally want to get out of a podcast? I'd love to be able to have interactions with cool people yeah. in person. And, I'd, and I've got mm-hmm. the space for it. I have the equipment to be able to do that, but I don't have um, being in Australia, <laughs> very isolated <laughs> it's spots. A like, far. Yeah. Uh, yeah. hey, Adam, you want to come out to the podcast next weekend? I'll foot the bill for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, Eugene, we'll, we'll I, I, here's, yeah. The, here's the biggest disagreement I'm going to have with you because I, I'll disagree and I'll tell you why. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of paralysis by analysis yeah. going on yeah. right now. I don't, I, I disagree. You could do just fine by yourself. You're very, very uh, articulate and you could pick a subject and you don't have to do, we do five podcasts a week. That was our strategy was mm. to just blow people out with information. Plus we like to talk. You do one episode a week and it would support your social media and you would sure. literally bring up a subject and talk for 45 minutes on it. I think you were made for, for that type of well, thing. Well, there's That's other ways to that. do it too. Uh, in fact, actually, I think you you mentioned uh, Andy Galpin earlier, yes. which by the way, it's so crazy to me. Isn't it wild how not popular he is? I know, it's, oh, it's, it's, know. it's messed he up. It's, best, it's, yeah. it's because he's not clickbaity. It's because yeah. he is, and he he's, every time he, one of my favorite things- He doesn't things look about, like a big juice head well, either. One of my That's favorite it. things about uh, Andy when you talk to him is he is very careful to, uh, every time, he, he never speaks in certainties. Mm-hmm. Even when he's speaking about studies, studies, mm-hmm. He'll always tell you all yeah. the nuances of it and yeah. what, what we're we know getting. right now. Yeah. yeah. So he's, but unfortunately, he's just not popular. A lot of people don't know who he is, but I think he puts out some of the best yeah. uh, information. He, my point of bringing him up, he uh, he does seasons, which I think is kind of cool way to do it. If I were to do podcasting seasons. over, if it was just me by myself, mm. I would actually plan out twelve episodes. That way, I'm not held accountable to like every week have to come with this thing. Ah. I'd plan out my twelve episodes, and it would be a season. That way, I know the content I'm going to produce. Now, hopefully, I'd get some guests. Maybe I could convince to come in. If not, I'd hold some by myself. But then, when I'm done with my season, I can pause until I'm ready for my next season, and so they release it like a Netflix yeah. show. I love that. Yeah, it's smart. What's his podcast? Is he, oh, I forgot what his- I really his, like that idea. Yeah, like that. no. There's other yeah. people that do it too. I just remember yeah. he was one of the first people I saw that did. He might not even still do it anymore. Yeah. It was like but, a lot of historical stuff too, with like bodybuilding and- he Yeah, yeah, like yeah. He's really a real cool. historian around yeah, bodybuilding, yeah. so he's fun to yeah, talk to about this. Cool. Yeah, I think that's cool. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right, Stuff, because I know for myself, I'm a big paralysis by analysis in oh, this. Okay. And for podcasts, I know that's, that's my thing is like, 
Does it have to be perfect? It does not. Mm-hmm. But my thing that holds me back is like, oh, I want it okay, to Okay, you know what'll help? <laughs> yeah. Go back, and I don't want my audience to do this. Don't do this, audience. <laughs> but I'll tell you, go back and listen to our early episodes, and you'll be like, oh, okay. <laughs> spiders, these guys, spiders, these guys can do it. Yeah, they do not, there's no paralysis by analysis here. We no, the movie's terrible. a season thing, because you yeah, can come yeah. up with 12, I love that. I yeah, love that 12 episode that topics really that you have. Maybe you could even do plan in ahead where you line up, like I said, a couple guests where maybe mm. you could do it, or if you were over here, you could do one, right? And then, uh, and then, then you don't have that pressure of like you have to every single week yeah. drop. No, you know? I really, I really do like. Yeah. I can focus for for twelve weeks or yeah. for twelve episodes. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to in twelve days even. I can do that. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll just fall face of the effort yeah. for twelve yeah. years. I mean, <laughs> you're one, you're one of the guys that are out there, you know, in the, our space that I think does a really good job of communicating both the science base and then you also have the experience of training real people. That's one of the things that's interesting today. Is you have, uh, I mean, this didn't exist when we were coming up. You have like online coaches, coaches yeah. who like yeah. literally have never seen a body in person. They've just yeah. they yeah. got their they've certification. Read a lot of books. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, they may have read some books. So they under, uh, uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> not all of them. You know, <laughs> yeah, but, and, but they haven't actually gone out and trained a lot of people, and they're yeah. out there providing information and and arguing and debating, and they're good at social media. Mm-hmm. So that's the the challenge mm-hmm. is like they're good at gaining attention, yeah, and so they're popular. But as far as the the advice. Uh, an experience they have. They just lack that. Yeah, really. I mean, you learn so much, you know this, because you train a lot of people. You learn so much because you can look at the evidence and say, high-protein diet is superior, but I've worked with, not a, this is not a majority of people, but a minority of people where it just messes with their digestion. For sure. So it's not a good option for them. For sure. Uh, so that experience goes a long way. But I definitely think you were made for discussion. Thank you. Because the, the, the other platforms, I mean, YouTube, you can do this. YouTube yeah. gives you the opportunity. But the other platforms are like quick bit, and we know mm. we do this too because they'll they'll take one something that we said, make it a short clip, and it's controversial. But and people will comment, and I'm like, okay, you got to listen to the episode because this yeah. this doesn't explain the whole thing. This is just me making a statement that was designed to get your attention. But yeah. this is much more of a discussion. Absolutely, so. I mean that's what it's designed for. I mean it's one thing. That's why, like, as much as I hate TikTok, I know what its what its benefits are. So I just got to make sure I don't look at the comments. I got to make sure I just put the content I want out and get out. Same as Instagram is like I know what, I know what this is good for. I know what the stories are good for. The story shares. I know what this platform is made for for maybe interaction with some people. But I know that it's not made for long form. That's where I have the YouTube as well. But then definitely I know that a podcast would be the, the final tier that helped to just bring it all together. What's your main source of business? Is it uh, is it coaching and training people or do you? Um, it's it's my app. So Gambaru Method is, oh, okay. is my app where it is like a program coaching, nutrition, education platform has everything that I do is all on there. People can like, similar to all the math, math programs that you have, yeah. instead of having individual purchase bundle programs where it's all in the one uh, membership. Got it. And um, so people there's like a few tens of thousands of people on there using these and interacting and getting critiques, everything. Mm. Um, and that's that's the main thing. I used to do a lot of touring. Like when I was here last time, a few years ago, yeah. pre, pre-pandemic, it was, I was on the road for like eight, nine months just running events and, um, and then um, oh, that that nearly killed me <laughs> that, that, <laughs> burned, that burned me like oh, I was I was kind of happy the pandemic happened like oh I can I've got an excuse to not go on tour again <laughs> <laughs> and I could dr- drive lining. I could focus a lot more on the um, on the app side of things which which honestly made a lot of what I do a lot more accessible because for people to come to an event or for people to do online coaching with me it's so expensive just because of what they have to invest to make mm-hmm. it worthwhile for me to be able to meet up meet the demand right uh, I've got to jack my prices up. I was like well that's not feasible because it's not like for me to actually train someone or coach somebody one on one, same as you guys. Yeah. What would your hourly rate have to be? Yeah, yeah. you got to measure the cost benefit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the cost of yeah. not doing something yeah. else. And it, like it for sense. you guys, it probably would easily be a few thousand dollars yeah. for a single session to make it actually worthwhile, but right. versus what you would be spending the hour doing. Yeah. And then realistically, is it actually worth that person to spend a few thousand dollars for one session? Absolutely not. Mm. Yeah. They're better off seeing a PT in the anytime fitness around yeah, the corner, yeah. Yeah. and they're gonna get. A similar benefit for for more value, and right. I respect. I say, like, you know what? That's why the app or the ebooks that you guys have yeah. they're so beneficial because it makes it more accessible to be able to get what they need at a reasonable price. Yeah. I keep hearing about the how the fitness and health um, scene, I guess, for lack of a better term, in Australia is just massive. I keep mm-hmm. people keep telling us you got to go to. <coughs> is it is it like a big? I, I, is is that sure. accurate? Okay. Yeah, like when it comes to. Um, I look at it from when huge I huge fitness culture, right? Yeah, when when I was touring and doing all my events. Um, 
and it's a bit biased because I am Australian as well, but I do I do see it playing out with people like Charles Pollockon when he was around. He was touring a lot, um, and I was helping to organise a lot of tours for other people as well. The biggest places that would sell outs in terms of for fitness based education and training it was Australia, the UK. They were the top two. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then next would maybe be through Asia, maybe Singapore, maybe Canada. They'd be kind of neck and neck. And then you have some random places like Norway or something we wouldn't even think of, but these other countries in Europe. The States would actually be surprisingly low. Even though you have so many people within the States who care about fitness, especially here in California, it's such a very um, fitness forward space. But I find that for whatever reason, people don't want to spend money in Mm -hmm. the States on education, whether it's an ego thing, whether it's a, Oh, cultural thing i'm not too sure what it is i think they know yeah. what they're doing <laughs> I, honestly i think that i think it's personally sad. um outside of effectively <laughs> i think yeah, yeah. yeah i think they have that belief though yeah. i think i think it's because i think culturally um in for whatever reason in the uk through asia and in australia people are a lot more willing to be like hey i, d- I don't know I don't know. I need to learn more from these people. I need to learn more to get better. Whereas in the States, everyone's like, I know, I know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm <laughs> exactly. the fucking king. I'm <laughs> exactly. the best. You can't tell me shit. Or no. they'll respect that they don't know enough, but they don't want to spend. Mm-hmm. They don't want to spend much money. Interesting. They'll spend like 50 bucks and that'll be expensive. Yeah. You know? Uh, if I, I wonder spend, if it's just the competition. There's so much competition. It might be that here. as well. Yeah. You know? It could be that as well. Yeah. But I find like if I, if I run an event in, in Australia, it'll sell out in about 10 minutes. Wow, if I run cool. an event in the UK, probably maybe an hour. US, it'll be two months to maybe sell. Wow. <laughs> we would have we would have been out there. We would have been out there yeah. by now, but you guys have such big spiders. I don't know if I could <laughs> They're not that bad. I mean, look, <laughs> Bro, people, I've seen videos of okay? toilets. I just people, have to clean. It doesn't happen. Like I barely see anything like that. And the reality is the ones that are gonna kill you, you're not gonna see them. You don't need to worry about oh, that. Oh, I feel so much better. You're going to be dead. You're going to be dead. Who cares? Yeah, you know, you lived a good you. life. Yeah. Your time is now. I mean, yeah, koalas can give you it's gonorrhea. Real quick. I read it's that. Real quick. Eugene, who's, who are some of your favorite content creators in Australia? Who are, who are your peers uh, that you like? So um, my absolute favorite is my training partner, Sherelle. Oh, yeah. Sherelle mm-hmm. Grant, yeah, which is, again, it's going to sound incredibly biased, but she does put out some incredible content that um, like nuanced more for women. Yeah. Like she's an incredible um, role model for women. She's putting out really good nuanced discussions. Yeah. And she's, again, a person who um, doesn't want to be in an echo chamber. She wants to learn. She wants to always bounce ideas yeah. off other people and just expand her mind as much as possible. Um, other creators, like this guy, Luke Tulloch, you may not have heard of him. He I was know. he was based in Sydney, and now he's actually he's over in, I think, Sweden now because he went pre-pandemic on a holiday and then co- kind of got stuck there with his wife, and then they had a kid, and then now they're just – somewhere in Europe, but he, <laughs> I call him Australian so because he has an Australian accent, Yeah. Um, but he's a really good evidence-based, science-based content creator. Okay. Um, and again, like I, I, what I love is um, he's very like, much like an Andy Galpin. It's never definitive. It's never like, you should do this. It's always about, here's a mechanism. Here's what we know so far. Yeah. And here's how open it is to um, interpretation. Um, I think, I feel like us in Australia, we, we can adopt James Smith as, as a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like a, we're going to say, yeah, he, he's an Aussie. Yeah, he's an Aussie. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As much as he triggers a lot of people and he I loves love a lot of people the wrong way. If you look at where he's coming from yeah, and you look at his, um, his character, well, like what can we learn from that? Like yeah. whether or not you like the way his style, like I'm sure people don't like my style. I know yeah. that. Yeah. And he's comfortable with that. And say, what can you learn from the way that he carries himself? Yeah. Whether or not you agree with him, whether or not you agree with his style and his mannerisms the mm-hmm. fact is what can you learn from the way that he conducts himself and how he's clearly a very happy individual and he's very confident in himself and he wasn't always like that yeah i think that's yeah. something that's that we can aspire to say like, you know i don't want to be you i don't want to be like you but I, I i respect where you've come from and what you're doing and how you're living your life on yeah. your terms yeah i think the challenge is mm-hmm. uh, i like that um because i i don't mind disagreeing with people i don't mind mm. not liking your style what i mind is not people not being able to like debate and discuss like and being afraid or too sensitive or whatever, or triggered by it, that annoys the shit out of me. And I think you see more of that in fitness just because we tend to be more insecure because most people get into fitness because they had body image issues. I think that might carry over. Yeah. You know? Something you mentioned that I think is a, a really bright spot. You mentioned your training partner and mm. you know how she, how she's influential. The the communication to f- women about strength training has radically changed yeah. since when I first started. It's amazing. You know, I haven't worked out in a commercial gym in a long time. And I just re- restarted maybe six months ago. And I'm seeing women in the gym lift, deadlift, squat, bench, overhead press, using like challenging themselves with strength-based exercises like I'd never seen before. This is a totally different. Yeah. It was so different back in the day. 
that this is really, if I could point to one really positive change in the fitness space, I'd say that has to be one of the biggest ones. Yeah, yeah that's it's, a big one. It's incredible. And it's 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 honestly intimidating. So, <laughs> like people ask me and say, hey, Eugene, why don't you do powerlifting? I'm like, I don't want to do powerlifting because I will be outlifted by women <laughs> who are like four weight classes below me oh, because yeah. of just how many people are doing it. I saw Steffi Cohen squat 405. Yeah, right. Right. Like, like I'm done. I'm yeah. good. I, I'm happy. I stopped squatting. Yeah, I, I don't want to expose myself to any more ridicule than I already am. You know, just like leave me out of this kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's in incredible though, like seeing how women are um, a lot more confident and they're making a much bigger presence within the fitness industry. And I think it's so cool. And I think it's, it's actually an important thing is um, – if I look at my analytics on my my followings on yeah. YouTube or Instagram or whatever, I have like eighty percent male. Mm -hmm. But you look at my customers, it's like sixty percent female. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. and women are the ones who They're are the driving consumers. the industry forwards. Yep. Yeah. They're the ones who it's care. They want to learn. They've got no ego. They want to push the industry forwards. And that's why I think we're seeing such a big surge in the fitness industry. It's not because of men, even though men are typically seen as like the the authorities or whatever. You look at the biggest influence to create is it's mainly males, unfortunately. Yeah but they're not really the ones pushing the industry forward. You think they are because they're the faces of it, but really it's the women because they're the ones creating the demand. They're yeah. the ones creating the market. They're, they're the, the consumers. Ones, yeah, consumers. They're like that for most markets. A lot of people don't know that. They're yeah. the consumers of most markets. So yeah. uh, same same for us. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very true. Yep. Well, bro, it's been a good conversation. Yeah, yeah. I Thank really you appreciate you on. coming on the show. I like that we can talk about certain things and appreciate what you're doing. And I think you should start a podcast. I really do. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Well, you, There's you the I, I, love, I love that idea. Like the whole 12 week season or the, maybe, maybe, a, yeah, Four week, one one episode season. We'll, see, we'll still yeah. see what happens, but I love that. So thank you for bringing yeah, that up, yeah. and yeah, thank you for the time. Like I really appreciate. It. Like I, I love it when I came back when I came here. Like whenever it was a few years ago, I really wanted to come on, but we couldn't make it work. But I'm so happy we can finally make this happen. Yeah, it's no, for sure. For yeah, good deal. Oh, yeah. Love great having you on, man. Yep. Thank you, guys. How do I incorporate cardio and not lose muscle? I've seen people do this before where they'll start to lose the sharpness of their muscles or they'll start to lose the sculpt a little bit. And that's disheartening. But if you do it right, then you minimize that muscle loss or that metabolism slowdown. In fact, if you do it right, you can actually speed up your metabolism at the same time that you build stamina and endurance. You just have to be able to kind of program it properly. And the way to program it improperly is just to go and do as much cardio as you can for as long as you can. Right.